I think I think a good opening question too would be. Is he, is, <laughs> I'll edit this out. That's is fine. A, good way to a, lead it off. Just is, he a, is he a Bears fan? Because if he is, <laughs> ouch. Yeah, it was a, it was a bad day. Well. Oh, cold open. I guess we're doing that again. Here we are. Welcome back to another episode of Pass the Barb. I'm your host, Adam Bartusik. And uh, yeah, today today we will have a fun episode. And today is going to be a very different one. Uh, normally, we got our segments and everything. And I should say, I'm also joined by two of my great friends. I got Mr. Ryan Pinkala up top. Yep, ready to rip here, boys. I'm uh, I'm going to say it right now, and I'll say it again. I hope everyone's rating and subscribing to this podcast right now. Growing like crazy. Keep it up, folks. This is getting good. I should add with that Drunkwood, who we reference in all the episodes where Pinkala loses Wi-Fi, uh, he is donating. If you guys don't know, he does like barrel aging of artwork or something with like Kentucky barrels. I don't know it very well. I barrel be very aged wrong. artwork. Yes. Yeah. Exactly no, like right. literally if it you has look, to be it. If you look at it, it's like those <laughs> barrels of whiskey, like the wood. I don't yeah. know. I All think right. yep. I could be very mm-hmm. wrong by this. Mm-hmm. But anyways, he's uh giving to our giveaway package for hitting the subscriber or the rating mark that we want on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. He's adding a uh hand carved musky. So that's very cool. But anyways yeah. We will go to Sam Sobey, the man who has come out of the depths of somehow winning the last weigh-in. Yes. Being not yeah. prepared on best round things. Uh, it was good. We, we left out some things. I think we, we got a little bit of flack that we didn't mention the boob uh, as one of the round things. But other than that, I think people people enjoyed what we had to say, and it was good. It was yeah, it was a good win, and we're going to do a lot more of those. So we, I got to say thank you as well. We're the number one outdoor podcast in the world right now currently. So thank you so much for everybody that's made that possible, and I appreciate the hell out of it. So I'm excited for tonight. Tonight's going to be a really good night. Yeah, tonight will be great. And with the way in like Sobe said, we have received a ton of bad flack for missing boobs. So we <laughs> really apologize. It was guys. our fault 100% actually. Yes, like and there has been a lot were. of heated discussion on if a cheese curd is round and if a hockey puck is round. So thank you, everybody. Mid- we're moving yeah. on from that. It was a great way in. If you have other absurd topics, we will do them. But like I was saying to begin with, today's episode is going to be a little bit different. Uh, as everybody knows, we've done segments. We do a bunch of different stuff to keep this fun. But I think today is going to be about why we first started this podcast. It's story time. It's telling stories from behind the scenes. And today we have a very special guest, a good friend of a couple of ours. And uh, yeah, Sobi, I don't know. You want to take this away? Yeah. If, if I had a sound deck right now where I could hit drum roll, please, I would just hit it and hit it and hit it. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the one and only Chicago native Alex Perrick. He runs the freaking ginormous YouTube channel, AP Bass, and he's got a whole pillar of credentials, everything from Never Stop Tours to a million different brands underneath his sleeve to 39 hours to everything else underneath the sun. He is a tyrant in the outdoor industry and he's done just about everything. And he's been just about anywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Perrick, a little round of applause. Can we give him a little round of applause? Yeah. 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 Sound effects. Sound effects. How you doing, Al? (laughs) That was really nice. Sobe. thank you so much for that. And I'm very happy to be here on past the barb, mostly to talk to Adam, but you're my second and Ryan is my third person that I want to talk to, but mostly Adam, but I'm happy that's, to be here. That's, that's great. That's, how, that's what most people say, actually. So <laughs> yeah, all, all, especially all the female guests are, they're like, Adam's number one. That's, this is great. I, another great day for Adam. This is yeah. awesome. I love this. Do we have to introduce his mustache? Does that have a name? I, if yeah. we had Honor here, he'd be proud. Man, it was, get up it was close. a lot. Get up close. <sighs> Yeah, let's get. It was a lot dirtier two days ago, but I was talking to this female, and she told me that she wouldn't keep talking to me unless I shaved it a little bit. So I actually shaved it for her. You just I don't know, man. Yeah, the women got a control under me, I guess, and it's not good. But uh, yeah, I shaved it up a little bit. I like it. So nothing's changed from back in the day. (laughs) How long did it take you to grow the stash? And then has the stash been a conversation piece in your love life in the past couple years? Oh. Oh yeah. I, I think, I don't know. I've had a stash now for almost three or four years, actually like on and off. But when I shave it, it takes about a month and a half to come back. That's not bad. That's a journey. You gotta be committed. Yeah. 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 I like, I mean, I look, I look like Pedro within two weeks, but I I would say the stash takes about a month and a half. (laughs) (laughs) Well, perfect. Well, 
I think what what I first want to roll into, and kind of like Soby said, Peric, I think something that's very cool that we can reflect on, and Soby and I actually chatted about this. It might have even been a month ago, but I'm not sure if you're aware, but I want to go back to, I think this would have been six or seven years ago, about this time of year. Are you aware that about a dozen to probably 20 of the guys who are in the fishing industry now, and some of them fairly prominent, lives changed because of one decision you made and it was having a meetup at a Dick's Sporting Goods in uh, Bloomington, Minnesota. A lot of domino and effect. It, it, yeah, a lot of domino effect from one day. And if you think back on this, and we're going to kind of chat about where you were at in your career at that time, but that is where I ended up meeting you. Like a month later, Sobe ended up getting hired by you which then caused me to end up recording TYO stuff, which then trickle affected a lot of things for Sobe. And then, I mean, like Rello, Griff, like all these guys just based off of you showing up and me running into you at Dick Sporting Goods. And I, I don't think you've ever truly been thanked for all this stuff, actually, that you did help lead to. But it's crazy. That was like seven years ago now, wasn't it? So that was Ethan, my camera guy there? Was Ethan? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you, me, and Stearns went fishing the next day in the cities. Oh, yeah. But I feel like I knew who you were before that because I, like, I don't think I would have just went fishing with a random person. Like, were we Facebook friends or something? You yeah, might have only known Stearns at the time. I think we had oh, DM'd a little bit, but then you and Stearns connected you and me. Oh, yeah. Now I remember. Yeah, yeah. What? Have you guys talked to Stearns? How is he doing? Yeah, Stearns, Stearns is good. I actually fished against Stearns all summer. I haven't seen him a ton. I think he's just finishing college now. But, yeah, he's he's doing good. But going like going to that time, like, so that was – you had Ethan as your camera guy. You had just gotten back from – I think you had just dropped out of Alabama, basically, to go full-time into YouTube. And you had just gotten back from Alaska, I think – from some sort of trip, but like, where were you at in your YouTube career at that point in time? And like, we all you know where YouTube Alabama, is in the yeah. fishing industry now, but like, where was it then? What were you doing? I think that at that point it was, um, just figuring out if it was going to be something that when it fizzled out, I was going to have to go back to school or if it was like actually going to be a career and be able to, uh, make something out of it. I, it was, it was not, it wasn't like a for sure bet. It wasn't like I'm going to do this for the rest of my life and I'm, and I'm going to, uh, yeah, be able to do that. It just, it was, it was rocky. And, and Ethan, who was my cameraman at the, at the time had no fishing experience or any outdoor experience. So he, he was just kind of rolling with me. He had some editing experience and I learned quickly that it, it, it actually, you need a filmer that has some outdoor experience or else it's just, it's really hard to get an end product that a fisherman or a hunter wants to watch in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't think I really knew what was going on. I kind of was just living day by day and I still kind of take my life day by day, even, even seven years later, to be honest with you. I don't, I guess I have a clue at what I'm doing tomorrow at 6 AM, but after that it's yeah, whatever swipes right or whatever wind direction hits, it's <laughs> kind of where I'm headed. <laughs> yeah, I like that. No, so, that was like the wild west of the YouTube days. It was yeah. so early. Like there was you had even looked at me and TYO had nothing going on and you were like, dude, just quit and go do it. I'm like, what? <laughs> I wanna I, I wanna this, jump in. <laughs> no, I go had ahead. this go uh ahead. just this whole idea in life at the time that anybody could do it and all you had to do was try. And I still kind of have that mindset, but even for me with YouTube now, it's like so much more difficult to get views than it was back then. So I don't know, maybe if you have the right mindset, anybody could do it or you have to be a little bit, you know, dumb and naive. I don't really know. Yeah, I have to I jump you. in. This is like at the tip of my tongue. So like, <laughs> I like as we kind of go through kind of Adam's agenda he has laid out, I want. I want there to be like little sidebars we jump into. So we just talked about you had dropped out from Alabama. Um, you have this videographer, Ethan, working underneath you. And I feel like this was right around the time you, Ethan, and Spencer made your first trip to Alaska and you drove the whole way. 
And I just want you to give me a couple highlights that we would have never seen on film. Just the, the shenanigans between you and Spencer. Cause ain't no way you drove from Chicago to Alaska and you guys didn't want to just slit each other's throats <laughs> in the worst <laughs> way. There was, one, there was one time, I mean, there was a lot of slitting of throats almost, but I'll, I'll tell <laughs> two really quick things that I remember. I remember making it to the, like to Yukon and it was 3 a.m. And, and Spencer like drove all day, which as much as like he did drive all day, you, you, as the passenger, you don't really sleep during the day. At least for me, it's like on and off because the sun's up. So it's like, I don't know. I just slept the night before he woke up early and he's like, I'm going to put in 12 hours or whatever. So he puts in 12 hours and then I take over at eight or nine and it gets completely dark out. And then like 3 a.m. rolls around and I'm like, dude, I, I have to just pull over in a hotel, like a hotel along the Alaskan highway is like 80 bucks at the time, which yeah. I mean, 80 bucks is a lot of money, but to not die bed. on the side of a highway, it's like, maybe we should just get a hotel and get some sleep. And Spencer lost it on. He's like, you have no work ethic. You're just a spoiled little kid. Like, I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm going to crash this truck off the side of the road. We, ha- we get a hotel, we get a little bit of sleep. We, f- we then drive, you know, another, cause it's, I think it's 60 hours from Minneapolis to where we were going. So 60 hours of driving. Jesus like, Christ. Christ. And, and I complained and course, about our drive to Maine. That was 26 hours last winter. Wow. <laughs> and of course we don't have like, you always think you have enough time, but even 10 days or 12 days of fishing in Alaska just goes by like this. Like you just don't have enough time, especially when you're trying to figure out the bites. Uh, Cause at that point we didn't want to hire guides. We wanted to like, we had the idea of, getting a John boat, driving into Alaska and us catching a King salmon by ourselves. It quickly evolved into us reaching out to, you know, people on Instagram and helping us out because that was just a, a near dream. That was impossible, but we did finally make it 60 hours to set up camp oh, and wow. we go to set up camp and I don't know what happened. I don't know what stemmed the argument, but it ended up into a full on yelling match and Spencer saying, take me back to the airport right now. I'm going home. Like, <laughs> That's like this argument. is day one. This is day one when you got there. Like you made it, it like the whole day time. one. It was a. Ele- it wasn't even day one. It was eleven o'clock at night. The sun was still up because the sun doesn't set there. And he was convinced. If Ethan was here, he'd tell you the same thing. He was asking me to drive him to the airport to drop him off for him to fly home. Oh my! How far from the airport were you? We were at the Kenai, so it was probably three hours to Anchorage. <laughs> Wow. I'm sure after driving like oh the 60, God. you were like the next, yeah, the next thing I want to do is drive three more hours. So what was the cool Spencer thing f- about, I was going to say the cool thing about me and Spencer's relationship was honestly, like we did get into screaming matches like that, but then we'd go to sleep and wake up and act like nothing ever happened. It was kind of just <laughs> that's like beautiful. another day in the life. <laughs> That's, so Dude, that's just like that's such a like a dude's relationship though. It's just like you yell at each other and then like five minutes later you're like, all that's right, fine. like we're good, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you have y'all kill you, don't kill you right now. Bring me to the airport. Well, you'll be good. <laughs> no. So that that's good. But something early on in YouTube, and I think you and John can get credited with this, was like very early on, and I I'm sure you've talked about this at times too, but when Sobe and I, before we even knew you or had gotten involved with anything, and then we'll kind of get into this, some of the stories you have with Sobe, but before we'd even gotten involved, I vividly remember sitting in like the house I'm in now, my parents' house, watching Never Stop Tour, watching you guys come through Mille Lacs, and texting Sam and being like, this is the best way of documenting fishing I've ever seen in my life. And I just want to know, like, did you know how pivotal that would have been for like your career in YouTube? And like, how did that come to be? Where did that idea come from? Like that, that changed so much of the fishing industry. Like, like talking about domino effects, that was one huge one. I thought for sure. Yeah. I, I don't really know how never stop. Like, I, I don't know how it came to fruition other than the fact that John and I were trying to do a series and, we just wanted somebody to sponsor it. And I, I feel like, I don't know <laughs> how we paid. got connected. We, we were trying to get paid to go fishing was really yeah. what the premise was, honestly. But I don't know how we got connected with Luke Stoner, who was like running 
something called dynamic sponsorships, which was like the, it was like Toyota goes through a, a third party to work. Yeah. With they Ask still Master. sponsor the elite series. I met Luke down at, uh, when I covered some of the elite series stuff. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Dynamic sports or sponsorships or something like that. Yeah. Interesting. I think and they were doing a lot I think of college I, fishing at that time. Yeah. Yeah. They were. And I think also I got connected with Luke because I had a Lear top on the back of my truck and like Lear also like provided money to them or something. It was just like, I don't know, just randomly meeting somebody. And we pitched the idea. And to this day, I mean, they got more views for that <laughs> price. Like it was just so cheap what they ended up giving us. We, we ended up making no money because John broke my lower unit, which was like $3,700. And that was like the entire entirety of the whole budget was spent on fixing my boat after. But um, <laughs> needless to say, the videos just took off and it, it was like the first fishing series on YouTube that had a very big, large, consistent following. And yeah, I think the the premise was, hey, we're going to hop in the car and we're going to just go catch fish along the way. And luckily, we somehow caught some fish along the way. I just think, it, to me, it's crazy how, like, like you talk about, like, Netflix shows or, you know, Breaking Bad or The Office, stuff like that, where it's like, oh, you remember this pivotal scene or whatever? Like, what's crazy to me is I can remember how that changed the way I thought of filming outdoor stuff and, like, even certain scenes, like, the breakfast stop, the fishing in the cranberry marshes, Malax, John breaking your lower unit, like things like that are like, I feel like for people like me who grew up in that early 2000s time frame is like, it's ingrained in your memory. Like you saw it, you know, big time. And what I want to know yeah. is like, so, so Wes Davis filmed and edited all that, right? Wes yep. is a freaking gangster. Um, did Wes ever, film any like long form fishing series before this or had he always done kind of promo work before like had he done a long form series like this or, or i guess like where did west i guess where did west kind of maybe get inspiration to form formulate how did west get on board yeah because he wasn't hired true. by you guys at the time right what so i feel like john like John act, act found West, but it was through a company called Bad Fish, which Mystery Tackle Box ended up acquiring a couple months ago. And they were like a film and editing kind of brand that did some marketing work in the fishing industry. And I think West, I don't know if West had done any work for them prior to Never Stop, but like they hired West to come film for us. And then their logo was all over Never Stop One. They did do Never Stop Two. And then I ended up poaching West from them after the Never Stop tour. Yeah, <laughs> hell yeah! <laughs> How could you not? <laughs> West was a ball. He was so good. I think it was West was like kind of getting his foot in the industry. He'd done a lot of filming of weddings, and he like just liked to redfish on the side, and he like kind of just did that stuff. And he wasn't really passionate about weddings because like. I don't know. Watching other people get married isn't that fun, I guess. I mean, I'm not yeah. <laughs> interested in that. So <laughs> I think when he saw the opportunity to do some fishing and to, to edit fishing, I think that's where it like, he was like, yeah, I'm going to try this. I'm going to step away from the weddings. Yeah, for sure. Well then, so I think what that led into, and I think is where we all ended up starting to meet each other. And so we came on board with you and you guys, I mean, we'll have some very cool stories I think to talk about, but Never Stop started this like domino effect of all of a sudden everybody was filming mini series, travel vlogging and going across the country to chase fish. And in my opinion, it was like one of the coolest three or four year spans in YouTube for the fishing industry. Cause like, I remember you and I talking about this at one point, Peric, but like you didn't really make a lot of money doing it, but you were doing it. Cause like it was this chase of a bucket list item that like you wanted to do. And it was so pure and so sick. And it led to just all this content getting made. But that's, I think, where all of a sudden, like, Sobe comes into the picture after you have that meetup in Bloomington. Uh, Ethan leaves and then Sobe comes on board. And then I think, Sobe, you had said, like, you moved down to Texas. And that's the first week of, like, people talk about TikTok houses now. Like you guys were one of the first people to have like a content house with having all of you guys move into one house. Like, I don't know, just leading that off. Like that had to have been wild for all of you guys. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, think, thinking about it now, it's actually like the price of what the house was where we were since we weren't near a college. It actually was like, I don't know. It's, it wasn't like crazy. The house we got for what we were paying for was such a smoking deal because I know even my sister right now who's living in downtown Chicago going to nursing school, she's paying way more than I would pay to live in that house right there. I know everything's not about money, but it was just a good deal. Like it was like, all right, I have nowhere to live. I'm not going to school. Let's all get this house together and let's, uh, you know, let's get this good deal going. But I think me and John having non-adult supervision in a house together might not have been the best idea. Honestly, I think still to this day, I probably need adult supervision. Yeah, I think I think one of the best <laughs> ideas too was that Sobe moves down, and you're like, Sobe, I got this great bedroom for you, and you open it up. <laughs> I <laughs> How was your like bedroom, it. Sobe. <laughs> I just like that you're justifying the whole thing about it's like, oh, it was a good deal. That's why we did it. (laughs) The house was sick. That was a really sweet house. I have a question. I have a question. Sobe, weren't you in the master bedroom though? Like, I was in the closet of the bathroom (laughs) in the master bedroom. (laughs) The closet of the bathroom? I just thought it was a closet. (laughs) A closet off the bathroom. And then the master bedroom was turned into the podcast room and and the aquarium. Sobe. You were always taking shits. I just wanted to make sure you were right next to where you had to take a shit. I was the closest to the shower, to the shit, to everything. Complete darkness when you slept. No skylight. No no natural light. It was never knew going to bed. You're, if you're it was two bed. in the morning, noon, three in the afternoon, you had no idea. You were just waking up. But it was pretty, it was also, it was pretty sick. There was also no cir- circulation in the room. So if you like oh, didn't leave God. a door cracked, you would have suffocated inside that closet. <laughs> <laughs> it was sweet. So who of you all moved in there originally? Who was the original ones in there? It was a four bedroom house and we used the master bedroom as the podcast studio, which uh, I feel like podcasting back then was just, there wasn't really many podcasts and we probably as a Guggen squad, we should have probably kept that up and done a little bit better job of that, but that's hindsight talking. So we had the master bedroom, which was the podcast studio John and I both had bedrooms. Oh, actually, Flair's bedroom was upstairs too. So John, Flair, and I were the ones that well, ones that moved in. But Flair always had a house in Nebraska, even when he had a room in Texas. So Flair was only there probably ten or twenty percent of the time. And then we had we had lots of beds set up for editors for Wes. Spencer worked for us for a little bit, so Spencer had a bed there. Um, yeah, I think that was probably it. Yeah, and oh, then there was just always cool. people coming in, you know what I mean? Like, Jiggle and Jordan was always there. Yappy was always there. Kendrick's always rolling. Like, there's just people circulating in and out, and it was just, yeah. Like, the, yeah, it was the original kind of content house. Like, you saw with, I mean, it happened in, with TikTok, and it's going on now, but it was crazy when it happened. Um, but then it led to, like, the first trip. Your guys' first trip was Indonesia, right? Because if I remember right, or no, New Zealand. Yeah, because if I remember right, you tried to get Sobe to go to Brazil or something, but you couldn't get a passport approved or something like that. And then Brazil was yeah. Brazil was after New Zealand. It was like November was New Zealand, and then December I went to Brazil, and then straight from Brazil I went to Mexico. I think. Yeah, that yeah, Sobe was talking about you're on a bender, but like going to New Zealand, all of a sudden Sobe drops out of college. Well, I was going to say, you. that all happened in a very quick time frame. So kind of the breakdown between, like, Sam, you going down there and getting that shot or whatever, and then you guys going on that trip, that all happened within, like, a couple weeks total. Yeah, probably. I, like, I sniped a doe with my bow. Alex is texting me. We get on a call the next day. He's, like, drop out of college next week. I'm like, okay, done. And did that, and I was a, a fifth-year senior, of course. Great responsible move. Ball down there. And then I know, I remember, like, right before we went to New Zealand, like, Al, like, Dude, I just remember rolling in there and Al is on the phone with customer service with Air New Zealand, just ripping him a new one. They were giving him the hardest time because he was trying to transfer Ethan's ticket to my name. And they were like, if it's an international flight, it's like a no go. They will not do that. And they would not let up. And that was, you remember that? It's for, it's for any flight because I had this brilliant idea the other day. I was buying t- I bought to Africa this summer and I was looking at tickets for Africa and I bought these tickets a couple months back and they were like a thousand bucks or whatever. And then I was looking at what the tickets were going for, you know, the week I left and they were going for seven grand a ticket. And I was like, 
I was like, if you had any sort of like, it, it'd be a gamble, but you could buy airline tickets and then sell them once the time came closer to people. Yeah. And I thought that would be like a valid idea, but I think that's why they don't let you change the name because they don't <laughs> want like, a yeah. bunch of Alex Perrick airlines coming up and buying all the seats on airplanes and then like monopolizing it and trying to sell it to the general public. But yeah, well, that, I, that would I basically don't... be like, uh, what's that? Uh, God, what is it that owns all the like, um, that brings us to our first ad read, SeatGeek Airlines. <laughs> yeah. Airlines. <laughs> yeah. Who owns all the, uh, God damn it, concert, concert tickets. Holy shit. What a Seat brain fart Geek. that wow. was. That was a really good segue. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember, but yes, like that. Uh, but yeah, you guys go to New Zealand. What, Sobe, I don't know. you guys. I don't know how, did I end up buying you a new ticket or did I? I think, I think you might've had to buy me a new ticket, but. Or they somehow rerouted. All I know is I had never, I'd been on flights before, but I'd never left the country. And you were, you were telling me your flight is going to maybe be the same there, but on the way back, you're going to have a layover in this other Island off New Zealand. Then you got to catch a flight to this other airport off this other Island. And then you'll have a layover and then you go home back to here where you have a layover. Then you get back to Chicago. And I was like, dude, I'm not going to be able to navigate this dude. There's no way I'm going to end up in New Zealand alone. Mind <laughs> you, how old were you at the time, Peric, when you guys were doing this? And how old were you, Sobe? Oh, God. I think Al was 19. I, I had to be 22, and you had to be 26. No, dude, There's Al, no way. Al, you were 19, and I think I was 22. <laughs> There's no way, dude. This was – maybe it was five years ago. Yes, Oh, dude, I feel like I didn't have my fake ID though. <laughs> you might have, or you might have gotten it taken away. Where was it? I got it taken away in Milwaukee with you. Yeah, remember that? And then I tried to get it back, and, then and we think, didn't get it back. No, <laughs> he's like definitely. But so this that would have been. I think you're anyway. legitimately 19. Yeah, Eric. I think it was that long ago. 19, yeah. So yeah, mind you, Eric's buying international flights for a camera guy at the age of 19 for a dropout fifth year senior. <laughs> what could what go wrong? Could go wrong. What's no, up? So what did you guys fun. do in New Zealand, Peric? Like, what was some of the highlights well, you had? And down you got there? hooked up with some people there, right? Like, how did that? What did we not do in New Zealand? Yeah. I feel like it's a better question. We we made some some questionable calls. Some we did somehow catch fish though. Um, which was yeah. cool. We, Some wicked we met fish. Like, yeah. Dylan Boothy. Yeah. And then, and then, um, name? and then Gareth. Gareth yeah, was I saw Gareth. Them. I saw Gareth the other, like what I went to New Zealand in April. So I saw Gareth in April this year. Is he doing good? He's doing great. Killing it. He's, he might've hit a uh, hundred thousand subscribers. Let me see. I Really? Uh, he was like so pissed because he was just, he had like 999 or he had 99,900 and he couldn't get the last hundred um, subscribers. And he was like, just like, I need to get this. I need to get this. Garrett's I was like, been I'm going hard for a while. Okay. Sorry. It wasn't 999. He had like 92,000 and now he has 93,000. So he needs 7,000 more subscribers. So trout hunting New Zealand. Go follow him and subscribe to him because he needs to get 100,000 subscribers. And he's a wicked cool dude. Like he's a nice yeah, go, And he's awesome. Just, yeah, just go start commenting Pass a Barb on all his stuff. Yeah. <laughs> that should do it. But yeah, I haven't released my New Zealand videos where I gave him a good shout out, so I got to go do that. And uh, yeah, that's – that's I got too much footage in my vault right now to even admit with a straight face. But uh yeah, we went to New Zealand. We hooked up with Dylan. I almost wanted to punch this kid in the face because I traveled halfway across the country to go fishing in New Zealand. And there was this pipe, which I actually fished last time, still had fish on it crazy five years later. But um, he he was like, we saw these fish in this pipe. And I was like, dude, just let me take a cast in this pipe. Like, I just want to catch a fish. And his he was younger than me. He was like 17, I think, at the time. And he was all giddy, all happy. Like, he reminded me a lot of myself. I just didn't have the patience for him as I would today. Like, I feel like I was a child and my patience level was maybe a 1.2, but he ran out and just cast it in this pipe and caught this fish. And I was so pissed at him or, or he lost the fish. Or he did some, he did something that really pissed me off. And I remember like, we well, he like, like brings it to the spot. And like you said, you travel halfway across the world. I got cameras rolling stuff like this. And he's like, watch this fires right at these fish's face. This is, and obviously like things spread out after that. And we're like, Oh, he's hooked up. But, 
he just was always like when we got to the spot he was always casting at the exact juice and I, and it wasn't like i hired him as a guide or anything so i just think we both had the wrong impression i just really wanted to catch a fish in new zealand and i felt like this kid could catch these fish anytime in his backyard and i didn't know if i ever was going to come back so he just like got aggressive but we ended up meeting gareth who ended up introducing me to a guy named ben boothy and he taught me all about rolling eggs which has become so much popular now when i came back there this time every there was so many more people there so be this time and so much more pressure really? so much harder to catch fish yeah it was it was ridiculous but uh rolling eggs was kind of like a yeah, I was going to say, like, like they do in Milwaukee, basically? Um, Milwaukee's oh. a little bit different when they're rolling eggs because they're using, like, spawn sacks on a float, and, and it's going down. Um, I actually fished Milwaukee yesterday and uh, watched some guy next to me absolutely obliterate him while I was casting a little Cleo trying to snag some fish in the tail, and that didn't work. I actually wasn't <laughs> trying to snag fish in the tail. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. But, um... Yeah, so rolling eggs is it's kind of like a drop shot. You have a drop shot sinker, and then it's it's on a three way swivel. So it's where your drop shot hook would be. There's a three way swivel down to a weight, and then off the three way, there's a a, a little foam egg, and you walk okay. down the canal. It's it's super um, it's super like intense current, and that and that weight bounces down, and the fish are positioned with their heads into the current. So on that that little foam egg comes up. They come off off the bottom, and they just kind of like do one of these and eat the egg. And yeah, I figured it out because I caught two giants. Like I definitely figured yeah. out how to do it. And Gareth, who we, who's a New Zealand uh, resident to this day, that's the biggest trout he's ever seen. It was the one I caught that day with Sobe. So Dude, it, was, it, it was crazy. And the dynamic is nuts because like, they also are like running these fish hatcheries, like in these canals. So you can kind of see like giant, just giants that are like being farm raised that they'll kill. And then, in this giant canal it's like public fishing and then alex is like walking down the bank he's like trolling by foot and it just looks honestly stupid but it's just it's deadly and we had the drone up when he hooks up with this freaking nuclear bomb of a trout like it was just it was the grossest looking fish i think i've ever seen in my whole life it was gross dude you also give me so a picture big. of that well, i remember that, seeing it yeah oh. at that time like dude there was not a lot of footage like that out there no, no, like, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, you see a lot more of that stuff now. Like, these cool wasn't a lot of drone stuff. footage out there, no, but that like that stuff yeah. was like mind blowing. That was like unreal, yeah. Well, and we'll move on to the next trip in a sec. But, AP, it wouldn't be right if I don't give you a second to defend yourself. Soby has told a story of you driving a right, uh, right sided oh. car in New Zealand. I forget, said, dude. We you had he a said he was just terrified. So do you want to defend your driving skills in New Zealand really quick? Just because Sobe was not as impressed. The I, I went with another person in New Zealand the second time. And she also told me that my driving was horrendous. <laughs> but like, I, I don't understand how this is possible when I've never been like, I, I've never been in an accident. No, Al is a, no, no. Al's a good driver. I'm never saying he's a bad driver. It is gnarly that we showed up and that day everyone drives on the opposite side of the road. And he's like, oh, let's go for a cruise. Let's go drive around. I'm like, we don't know how to drive like this. Like, we are programmed to not drive like this. He's like, oh, I'll be fine. Just drive on the other side. I'm like, I don't know, man. It was just <laughs> wicked. Lots of people tell me I have dumb confidence. And I think that is a moment where I just think I can do everything. And lots of times it bites me in the ass. But we, we survived to tell another story, Sobe. Oh, dude, yeah. No, it's a superpower, I'd say. Well, then uh, the next one we'll roll into, I think, is great that you guys can both elaborate on is Indonesia. And that would be, Sobi, I think the, the holiday is called the Day of Silence. Hold on. Before we get there, when <laughs> we're in Indonesia. No. <laughs> CQ Caroline is brought to you by Air New Zealand. No. When we were in New Zealand, Alex's buddy went bungee jumping, but we had the balls to try skydiving. And I know when you went back this time, you went again. And I want to know what your feeling was like the first time you went versus when you went back. I had so much more confidence the second time. The person I was with, she had never gone skydiving before. So I felt like it was younger me watching like, you know, like the young grasshopper grew up to be a bigger grasshopper. And I was watching the young grasshopper do what I did five years ago. And like, she was so nervous. Shit, and I, 
<laughs> and I had to just act so confident. And I was, I was pretty confident all the way until I flung myself out of the plane. And the second time we did it, the higher one. So me and you did 1,250 feet. The second time we did 15,000 feet. So oh. it was like a, a full minute of free fall. And I, I told myself after the first one, I was like, I'm just probably never going to do that again. And she also she said she was never going to do it again. But then like, now that I've done it a second time, I'm ready to go skydiving tomorrow. Like I, I really enjoy it. I'd do it again tomorrow. Seriously. Did you enjoy the free fall more this time? Like the second time around? Because like, I don't know. I was like, like same deal. We were kind of like, <laughs> and you got footage. Cause we hired this, the, like you can buy a camera packager where they film you and you you were just like, and I know I was doing the same thing, dude. Like I did not have my eyes open for probably about half of it. And I was just tense as shit, but I bet the free fall at 15,000 feet when you had already done, it was like, well, it's gotta it's be really better the it. second time. Cause yeah. you're less like, I'm going to die and more like, let me just enjoy this. <laughs> for sure. I was enjoying it way more this time. I got super sick the first time, not from the free fall, but from once the parachute came down and we were like going back and forth, trying to land on the spot. And this time, my guy was a little bit less like jerky and it's just, it was incredible. We, we also jumped a little bit different. Like what did we jump in Schweizel last time or where did we jump? No, we jumped in Queenstown. Quantico. Or, yeah. yeah. Quantico. Yes. But it's like a little bit different this time. We jumped like where we, where we trout fished in Schweizel. So oh, we like really? saw the, we, we were in the Valley and we saw the mountains on both sides, which is really cool. And yeah, I, I do it again tomorrow. Like I said, I love skydiving. I think it's cool. I think it's good to get out of your comfort zone and yeah, go do it. Well, that's, that's great. I do. We're, we're going to roll into now. Cause I want to hear about it. I want this day of silence. Like it was just epic hearing about it afterwards. So you guys fly to Indonesia for right. It was Indonesia to end up filming in Komodo. I think <clears throat> we, but did we spend so, much you know time what I'm in Bali? Why do you so look so confused here? We we didn't go to Bali right away. We no, we went to Bali. We went to Bali right away. That was in Bali. Oh no, we didn't. Was it? No, I don't know if we went to Bali right away. We were in some weird town right away, and they just brought us right to that hotel. Then they proceeded to lock us in. That hotel was in Bali. That was in Bali for sure. But Komodo is what you're thinking of. Is where we did all the fishing. That's a different island. But this was also the same trip where we went to Thailand. It could was be. it because did, right did we go right from there? Did we go right from there to Thailand? Right from Indonesia to Thailand? Yeah, I don't know if we did, but maybe we did. You think we went back to the states and then went to Thailand? Or I really think or you guys did? Or did you go <laughs> to Brazil after this, and then I flew home and then went to Mexico and then you went to Mexico and then and then we went to Thailand later with Jay after it was planned because. Yes, we were back in the States because you convinced Wes to come to Thailand with us when he was on the couch with us, like at at in Texas at the house. You're like, dude, just come. And he's like, okay. No, if only no, someone yeah, would have no, documented. Dude, yes, dude. we were not. <laughs> we flew from this was this was all in March, April. We went to Bali in March and then we went to Thailand in April. And it was like we connected through Qatar and went to Bali or went to Thailand. It doesn't matter. Moral of the yeah, story yeah, is yeah. nothing matters. We're gonna have to re- relook at this, but um, <laughs> the day of silence. The day of silence is. So you guys land there to start your trip, correct? Like you come. We land from... there at t- ten o'clock or eleven o'clock at night, and we shuttle to the hotel, and we go to sleep, and we wake up, and it's seven a.m. or whatever. We're like gonna get a nice start today. We're gonna go to a tackle shop. Nothing really big planned, but there's beaches. Bali's a cool tourist place. There's lots of hot women around, so like. I'm in my element. I'm ready to go look at some cattle, do whatever. I <laughs> and immediately there's a chain on the door. Like it, it's not like, it, it's not like a, it's like a chain that's wrapped in and around the door. And then there's like a big bolt on it. And it's kind of scary. You're like, well, why is there a chain on the door? We're like shaking the door. And they're like, you know, you can't leave. <laughs> that's what the front desk person said. You can't leave. <laughs> And John's like, what? No, no I what think we're going to go. We're like, well, we'll yes. be fine. Like, they're so like, who no, are you with leave. there, Alex? It's you, Sobe, John. And Dice. And Sam, and Sam, Sam Dice, Dice Sam is Dice. Yeah. one of my best friends from high school and also John's good friend from high school. 
he uh, just got engaged to Kaylee Joy. So congratulations to those two. Congrats, you know, Sammy. Like, uh, Congrats, well Sammy. Done. Well, well done. done. Congrats, Sammy. And we all went to high school together, me, John, and Sam. So we were doing – this is the second time we'd come to Bali, but we – had realized that there was this other island that was like a state park and you needed a ranger on your boat to go fish it. And it was super like you had to go through all these steps to go fish it. So we knew if you had to go through all these steps, the majority of people didn't know about it. So it, the fishing was going to be better on this island. But uh, yeah, so at that point, they said that there was these police that control the, the, the streets during that. And if you're seen outside, you immediately go to jail. Like you cannot go on the streets in Bali in this day. On the, on the day. So, and it's one day here. And that happened to be the day when we flew in. And just the eeriest deal is because on the top of this hotel, there was like a mini bar and a little pool. And you could look out into the streets of like, you know, an extremely populated area. And there's like no human beings outside. You can't even, we didn't like see another person except for the people in the hotel. It was weird. So then what did you do? We proceeded to get filthy drunk. I think we just got drunk in the hotel all day and stayed by the mini pool. I just like we were like we were kind was, of stuck. Like we're just stuck. It was like a, it was like a horror movie because there was like other parties involved. It was like a girl from I think she was from Australia. Sophie, did she Maybe? have like the mega big glasses or something, or that those dudes? I don't know. Yeah, and then there was some dude that looked like Post Malone. Yes. Yeah. 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 And then he was there with his girlfriend. And then there was like a few other women there. I don't uh, And obviously all, these like, people are tourists. Yeah. And, but the people that actually like ran the hotel and obviously the locals, they're like, there was like a, like a little language barrier. And that was the weirdest part too. Cause we didn't totally like, we didn't know anything about this day of silence. And then they tried to explain it and we were kind of like, no. And then they're like, yes. And we're like, no. And like, like yes <laughs> and so it was just it was freaky and we're like you know if it's a good day to die we'll just go to the mini bar up at the pool <laughs> i like so what we, you said about just... it being like a horror movie scene though you just got these little groups of people and you're like oh we're all trapped in here right now <laughs> like this could get we should have we should have filmed more and like made a made a video about it but it was just kind of one of those things where we're like we're gonna let loose before we got to go film for the next week so we let loose it was a good time I don't, I don't remember much other than like in the middle of the night, I ended up like going somewhere before bedtime. So I was like, I stumbled back in the room at like 3 a.m. or something. And I, what something happened when I came in the room, like you were like on the toilet or something. I don't know. Something happened. Or I think Sammy D was. I think Sammy yeah, D Sammy, was yeah Sammy had like a big stomach ah, ache. And he was like, what are you me. doing, dude? It was like 3 a.m. and he was just like sitting on the toilet with the door open looking at me. <laughs> oh, gosh. I How was the fishing in Komodo, though? Was that trip? That's where you guys did the GTs, right? That's I've all those were some of my favorite videos to watch. Yeah. Uh, anything with top water, especially saltwater fish, is usually a good time to watch those fish absolutely crush it they want to kill whatever the heck is popping on the surface and those fish do john ended up getting a really big one which i'm glad for i think a lot of times on these trips i'll be real honest with you like i was more going for the experience i wasn't really trying to catch the biggest fish or anything like that i just wanted to catch one and go i think john was a lot more dedicated to try and getting like a super big one and he really wanted like the trophy and, and and that sort of thing and i think i was just more like hey i want to experience something new but uh we caught a fish every single day which was awesome and it was definitely unpressured but that water is nothing to joke around with i think if you were to rewatch those videos and just look at some of the the waves and some of the currents we were fishing in if you're to fall in the water there you would get sucked into the bottom of the ocean and die it's something not to really mess around with so that was also yeah, like back, cool. it was like <laughs> looking back on that we probably should have had like some low profile pfds on or something because like we were we were hanging over the side of the boat cameras and john's landing his drone up here and we're all just like running around everywhere and they had deck hands hanging everywhere and like alex said it's like like wicked ocean currents wicked wicked visibly you could see like it, it'd be game over if you went overboard i don't even so, know if the self-inflating pfds would do anything yeah, at that point not, but what do you got pink so alex like at this point in time i mean this is like 
you're doing like this major international, like back to back to back trips and doing all this cool stuff. And like at this point in your career, like this was probably like your biggest send, right? I mean, out of everything that you'd done, like in, I mean, obviously looking back now you can and all the things you've accomplished since then, but like in that moment, did you realize like how heavy of a situation that was that you were like accomplishing a lot of these huge goals that would like lead to bigger things like moving forward or how, like, how is that playing out in your head during those, those trips? I think I had an issue with uh, like being content and looking for what I had accomplished. Even to this day, I have an issue with it. I think, like I said earlier in the podcast, I'm more of somebody who lives day to day and, and doesn't tend to like think about what has happened or think about what could happen. I think about just like what is immediately in my vision. I have uh, yeah. Like, so I didn't know anything about all that. It was just like, I have enough money in my bank account to cover my credit card bill for this month because I spent way too much money flying across the country on something that I don't really know why I was doing other than the fact that it was fun and cool. And yeah, it was just kind of very short term thinking all the time. I mean, it's good. Like it, it, it worked out really well. It's just wild (laughs) It like was think gas about the floor at that time. It was so just gas like, the floor. We were just doing so much. Well, that's the thing. It, like, because you kind of went zero to a hundred on like doing all these crazy trips and uh, you know checking a lot of these like international trips off that like most people you know will never do or that you know they dream of doing one of these, and you guys were just going ham. Yeah, I I think. I never, even to this day, I don't truly realize how lucky I was back then to make the decisions I made off the tip of like, a, I don't even know what the expression is where you're like making crazy uh, decisions like that super quickly, but I just kind of rolled with it and made the decisions and it turned out. Yeah. Well, you guys made a lot of good ones. And then I think that rolls into well, good and bad, but yeah. <laughs> I want to I say one, that, one thing, one yeah, thing before be you go farther. One thing I, I was talking to Al today on the phone. One thing I thought it was super creepy is it was just at this island of Komodo. So like from where we were in Bali, then you fly to this island in Komodo and that's, that's where we did most of our fishing. And it was like a really kind of a, a, a pretty low income, uh, just like a village town, but they had loudspeakers throughout the whole place. And I don't know, um, because of their religion or whatever, like eight times or five times, how many times Al? throughout the day i want to say i think it's five times a day they pray but i'm not i don't i don't want to yeah i don't quote me on that but yeah they just would play this screeching loud prayer like almost like i don't want to say it's like when an exorcist happens but it's like over the loudspeakers through the town and it was really just an eerie deal and it was this was a kind of a semi-sketchy town i felt like it was just like loud at midnight and you'd be like that was amazing <laughs> did they hire that, you to do he's did they he's hire had that in the holster for a while yeah. so we actually left your guys's hotel and he was just in the background with a microphone going ham that's why he disappeared all those times i just got the shower <laughs> But no, then those trips roll into, I think, kind of a cool backstory (laughs) that we can dive into as you guys go down to Mexico. And uh, this is where, you know, Guggen Bates ends up originating is on this Mexico trip. Um, I mean, Sobe, you know a lot more about this than I do. But you guys go down to which one of the Mexico lakes did you guys go down to at that time, Perry? Tomadero? Yeah, Camadero, Ron Speed, I think. Ron Speed, yeah, I wonder how he's doing. Um, I feel like there was something you said in the podcast, Sobe. I, I wish I would have prepared it, but you said something that I wasn't true. Like you like had a different take on something, and I wanted to combat you on this on the Mexico trip. I forgot what it was though. I'm gonna go oh, about shit about about the car about the cartel or or about the gas on my ass. Yeah, so I think it was about the gas on your ass. Like you said a part <laughs> of the story, and it was like. I don't think that's what actually happened. Maybe it's because you were freaking out so much, but I, I was freaking out <laughs> over that. What did maybe you maybe you saw this different part? But I remember some of the guys like some of the guys saw a ton of fields that had a bunch a bunch of weed in it because this is like oh, Commodore yeah. was in in the hills of like cartel weed country, and they were they were steady growing. 
Big time. I definitely did see it. I saw it for sure. And I saw like the little motorcycles. They like ride out of the fields with big white bushels on the back of their motorcycles and then put the motorcycle in the little boat and then shoot across the town. Yeah, I saw that. But I think there is this misconception that like, I mean, I'm sure there's some extremely, extremely dangerous parts of Mexico, but like there's this misconception that like, even if you're in cartel country, that like the cartel is going to take you or something or whatever. Like, I feel like as long as you don't mess with their operation and maybe, maybe, you know, the right people too. I, I think you, you're fine. Cause we were, we were pretty much in the heart of it. Yeah. As long as you're not like trying to steal any other drugs or trying to steal any other women, I don't think they're really going to care about you to be honest. Cause they know yeah. if they mess with U S citizens, they know the U S government or like there could be repercussions from like, they're just trying to do business. And if you're not messing with their business, you're going to be fine. That's at least so, uh, my experience. With, that's my experience with Mexico. Just yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So on that trip, AP, you guys end up like this is where the first like I think Guggenbaits are filmed. You guys are going out doing that. What was like that process getting a bait company and everything started? Like obviously where it where it is now and everything, but like you guys were just at this starting point and getting rolling. Like what? How do you even get that rolling? Like what happened there? You, you get what I mean? It was, it was a lot of us saying no to other people that wanted us to like promote their baits and just realizing we had potential to build something bigger and just, uh, we wanted to, yeah, take a shot at doing it ourselves. And we were lucky to be able to be connected with one of the greatest soft plastic bait designers in the industry, like baits that I was using when I was trying to fish tournaments, like the rage speed or the rage craw and all of the rage products. We were able to connect with the designer of that Steve parts. And he took me under his wing and took a lot of the Cubans under his wing and brought me to the manufacturing plants and showed me how to make the baits and how to sketch them. And uh, yeah, just, it was crazy because we were making the baits with the best dude in the industry, in my opinion, at the time. And we came up with some really creative names. We obviously had the video and marketing on our side and it just, it took off. I never realized how big it was until I sold my shares to private or not all of my shares, but I sold the majority of my shares to private equity in 2020. But I didn't ever realize how big it was until then. Like it was, even when I saw it in Dick's Sporting Goods, I never really realized how big the company actually was. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Did you then go overseas and like see the manufacturing plants and everything and like get involved with that whole process? Yeah, I've been to China four times, been to two or two different manufacturing plants for a few different uh, companies I've been a part of and a few different shows over there for uh, sourcing products and, and stuff like that. What are the trade shows yeah. like over there? Like, what are the trade shows like in factory sitting in China? Is it just insane? <laughs> the factories are a lot more, um, I don't know. They were pretty normal to me. I didn't see any child labor or any like hazardous working conditions or anything like that, that I think a lot of China is portrayed as, and the cities were very clean and it seemed like, you know, it seemed normal it didn't seem like it was crazy but the trade shows were actually crazy the amount of suppliers and vendors and just different like i just remember seeing so many different sims jackets and so many different like ripoff products that they were trying to sell to americans there that it was just like every booth i'd go to there was like some lure that had already been made for the last 10 years and like a company trying to make it themselves and trying to sell it to another american company it was china's ruthless there's a lot of uh just <laughs> do whatever you want over there kind of deal. But uh, it was an experience. I'm very thankful for being able to go over there and experience that. For sure. What was your most memorable, I guess, Sobe, you could maybe chime in with this too, but what was your most memorable or favorite trip you did overseas? Like whether it was filming or whatever, like what was your one that you like hang your hat on and you're like, that was it. I don't know. Cause they're all like with, different with Sobe or just in general. You could do one each. I always tell people that my favorite trip of all time is New Zealand. Like I always tell people that's my favorite place to go. I could see myself living there and just, I love the canal trout fishing. It's kind of 
right up my alley. It's almost like a stocked pond, but with giant rainbow trout that are eating pellets. So it's like, I don't know. It, it suits me because I know that at one point they're going to bite and I know they're in there. So I always tell people New Zealand was my favorite. And the second time I went back, it was even more fun because I rented a van. So I was able to just stay on all the fishing spots all the That's time. That's so, so sweet. I'd, it was amazing. I just parked the van right at the spot I was staying at. And I was up at 4 a.m. right before the sunrise came up and throwing jerk baits and just crushing fish. It was so much fun. Um, and I'm, I'm a freshwater guy. I'm a Midwest guy at heart. As much as I always try and leave the Midwest, I always find myself coming back to the Midwest. And I feel like New Zealand is kind of like the Midwest a little bit, as far as the trout goes, the weather goes, the scenery goes other than the mountains, of course, but, um, the climate suits me being a Midwestern boy at heart. I like it. And then, I mean, we can chat Thailand too, if you want, but I think the biggest thing here is you and Sobi have matching tattoos, don't you? Oh, that's from Thailand. <laughs> yeah well i'll give my two cents on like every every trip, every, every trip. <laughs> Not that. Every trip i take it i take i take it back what i said i feel like it was a misconception of the thailand story is what you said you said something about that night and you were in no decision making to tell any stories about that night because the video of, i have of you on my phone from that night you were incoherent like i could get probably arrested for what i put you through that night but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's half the fun, though. That's how, like, when we're in a nursing home, and you could, and you're gonna probably actually be able to tell the actual story of that night. <laughs> These ladies that are washing your feet are not gonna believe a damn thing you're saying. <laughs> incredible. No, I think New Zealand was incredible because of um the country, just like the mountains and, and just everything's so green and it was lush and like you drive up these different bluffs and around here and it was badass and then. Same thing with Al. Like I just, I always thought like the trout deal was super sweet because I like fresh water more because I just, I don't have enough experience in salt water to like equate. Like if you caught a Trevally or a, a you know, a blue Trevally, a green Trevally, a yellow Trevally, a giant Trevally, like, is this a good one? Is this a bad one? You know what I mean? Like if you catch a giant trout, you go, Oh my God, that is a big trout. Or if you catch a big walleye or a bass or muskie, you go like, you know, it's a big muskie. Cause you at least have kind of a gauge, but yeah, New Zealand for, for um that mexico for the freaking the folks there that weren't just us young dudes like the steve parks uh alex and i fished with denny brower we flipped bushes with denny brower which was incredible and he's like at the time i don't even think al really al and i really knew the opportunity it was just to kind of go flip some damn bushes with the legend denny brower who basically invented flipping a jig in bushes so that was pretty badass. And just like, what was the, what was the other guy? Terry, um, God, he like had a heart oh. attack. <laughs> Tell that story, dude. That's incredible. Did he? Where they took him to the hospital or something in yeah. Mexico. Yeah. I don't know his name, so I feel like it's not doing him justice right now, but that guy was oh. also a legend. Uh, he built the spinner baits. O Odin. Odin, Odin spinner baits. Oh, Steve Parks, big O. No, no. Oh, Odin. This guy, I don't, yeah. did, was he, was he passing a kidney stone or was he having a heart attack? Either way, the dynamics I, is like a bunch of young dudes <laughs> like us. And then there's like these, the group of five OG legends who are like 60 to 80 year old dudes who are like, we've been going to Mexico for 30 years and blah, blah. blah. And they are really, really old. And we are out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and then tell them what happened to freaking Odom. We'll call him Odom. I think his name was Odom. Yeah, they, he he woke up and he wasn't doing well. And they and Steve went into his room and, and told the guy, they're like, they got, you got to take this guy to the hospital right now or else he's going to die right here. And they like, <laughs> carry. <laughs> they carry. I know it's terrible, but they carried him out, put him in the van and drove him three hours to the nearest Mexico uh, hospital. And they shot him with something to like make his kidney stone or whatever was going to calm down his heart. I don't know what happened, but. He ended up surviving, so he didn't end up dying, which is cool. And uh, yeah, that was a that was a crazy story. Thailand was really cool too, just to the fact yeah. that you were able to catch saltwater groupers in a pond and catch so many different species in all these ponds. It, I love pond fishing as much as yeah. people say it's shooting fish in a barrel. I think it's good to hone your skills in, and it's crazy to have such a small body of water produce big fish. And Thailand's known for that, and one of my favorite like role models of all time, Jeremy Wade, he went and fished one of the spots we fished there, um, which is like super well known for fishing in Thailand. And 
it's known for its adult nightlife, but Thailand really does have some really, really good fishing. And I'd go back there in a heartbeat. Um, yeah. Do you remember some yeah. of the street food we got too? Like, dude, they were. Oh yeah, they the were, duck. The wicked duck. Alex bought like this full duck that was like grazed, glazed and smoked. And then we would get this wicked good ramen. Remember that? That ramen truck. Is that, that is that like, would you consider that probably the best international trip for like food? And Because I mean, obviously you guys tried stuff all over the place. Was that it? I mean. For sure. The food there, especially for the price, like 75 cents to $1.50 for full meals there. Like you being an American, your money goes so much farther there um, than anywhere else. Africa, these, where I went this summer, was really good for food too. But Thailand was also up there. Are these just like street vendors or like, what? how did you guys figure like because you got to kind of figure it out probably yeah, these are local street vendors ryan like yeah. this is this is straight up like you're walking in the strip of Hell the street yeah. and there's people set up their carts and they are selling shit and our yeah. guide who we were with who was like taking us to the different fishing spots he kind of like had little street vendors that he knew were you know top t- the guy who we were with definitely was a foodie so that helped because he yeah he was able to really show us around and what one thing be all about that Oh Thank yeah. I think that's, that. I think that's like half the thing about traveling, right? Is experiencing like the food too. Like you do all this cool shit, but like the food is like unbelievable in different parts of the world. So yeah. Eric, I, I know I how much you eating. love food and ice fishing. Have you gotten or seen pink's cookbook? Cause you need to get it for ice fishing stuff yes. and like cooking. Fish. I've seen, I've seen some of his stuff. I can't say I've seen the book, but um, yeah, I think that's awesome. I think there needs to be more, cooking in the outdoors i have lately i've had a traeger that's on the back of my boat i just have it attached to the back of my boat i and saw I'm that constantly i'm constantly just grilling ribeyes when i'm fishing now so i don't have to leave the water because i think one thing i always would have to do is like i'm starving i gotta go get some food or something and now it's just like nah, i'll just throw a steak on the traeger and keep on fishing now so <laughs> that's so i sweet. love eating. I, I like that <laughs> foam pad you put under it because i'm rigging up my boat to do the same thing so i like that idea <laughs> yeah and the cool thing is when you burn the foam pad you can just throw a new foam pad under there and it's not like a perfect carpet or anything <laughs> perfect one no, thing just... you bring Go up ahead. ice fishing and then we were on the topic of thailand and, and i think this is a crazy comparison it's like two different worlds but kind of the same thing like when al's talking about going and fishing those ponds it was almost like they had turned this pond fishing into uh a camaraderie sport like ice fishing was because they had these huts that were set up that had beds. And I think some of them even had like holes in them that you could have, that you could have fished down the ones that were farther out, but ours was opened up to this deck and you just fish right off the deck, but you could probably rent this little hut and stay there overnight. And almost like you're camping and you're sleeping right there. And then you're fishing right off there, just like you would do ice fishing. Like that's the closest thing I've ever found to like a permanent ice shack experience from open water, which is kind of, and the, kind of badass. the guys next to us were just getting absolutely buttered up. I remember waking up and they just had like <laughs> 20 bottles, just like lined up along their, their edge of their uh, cabana. And they were having a good time at night, just reeling in all these Ming Kong catfish. It was, it was crazy. There was, it was like, I don't even know how big the pond was. It had to be 10 acres. And there were supposedly was 50,000 fish. In this I believe pond. it, dude. I believe it. These giant bread balls, they just pack these bread balls loaded with hooks <laughs> and they bomb them out there. Wasn't, didn't they have a thrower? Isn't that how we got them out or did we cast them? No, I think we cast it. I think we cast it out like it was like a bobber. And then like once it hit the water, it like almost opened up and like dropped the bait. Yeah. Dang. Yeah, I don't remember bad. though. We got to go back and watch some of these videos. It's. <laughs> It's crazy how you think you're going to remember everything. And then you go and watch a video and you're like, wow, that is not what I remember how it happened, but that's definitely how it happened. Cause there's the video to prove it. <laughs> I just want to verify. You do have a matching tattoo with Sobe, correct? <laughs> Let's see it. Let's see it. No, I'm, I'm not bringing that. Come on. I want to <laughs> see it. You don't, have to, you don't have to tell the story. I just want to see it. I just want to see it. I don't know if it's still there. I might've had it removed. I want to see it if it's still there, if you got it lasered off. <laughs> we can I'm, cut this. I, we can cut I don't this. want to confer- want to- there's only there's only a few <laughs> girls in my life that know if I have a tattoo or not because I went and put it in a little a very it's not in a normal spot, I feel like a tattoo would be. So <laughs> I'm not I'd have, I'd have to take my pants off. I'd have to take my pants off and this thing would get flagged. So we, we can't do that. <laughs> Dude, they don't they don't flag us. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, anyways, okay. 
then we roll into um I think where we ended up spending a decent amount of time together, Peric, was ice fishing. And I know how much you love ice fishing. Mm-hmm. And kind of one of the first times we got to spend a bunch of time together was uh we ended up filming the voyage vlogs for TYO. But you and Wes joined us up in northern Minnesota and Sobe, and we did the crappie fishing. And then we went over to Schwamigan Bay and did some, uh, it was like trout mainly, uh, trout fishing and all that. Those memories are like ingrained in my brain from those times together. And I'll never forget too, we're out in this lake in the middle of absolute nowhere. And uh, I put my drone up and it just flies away. And I've never seen a man so excited (laughs) to see someone crash a drone. Because I buried it into a snowdrift. Otherwise, it was going to Canada. And you were so pumped about it. Bart, I don't know why I always used to pick on you. I feel like it was because you reminded me a lot of myself. But I I also vividly remember where I slapped you with that crappie. Yeah, you, you wanted to bleed. kill me. <laughs> yeah, you wanted to. Uh, no, actually, I slapped you with the crappie. And I was surprised you didn't kick my ass. Because you're a lot bigger than me. And you could probably pummel me to the ground. And you're just... You're a gentle giant, so I appreciate that. <laughs> I forgot well, you that were happened. all about the drone crashing into the snow. I've, I've crashed so many drones that I just think it it made me feel like a human that somebody else had did it, done it to in front of me. So, well, it made me feel a lot better when literally the next day we took it we took it to the hotel, we dry it out and everything, get all the batteries good, and we're like, I think it's good. And then I'm like, I don't know, Soby, you can try flying it the next day, and we're in like this forest with the long long alleyway and we're like oh my god this is gonna be such a sick drone shot and i look at soby i'm like you can fly it i'm not gonna crash it again it's gonna crash it's gonna take off on you and he's like no 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 no. it'll be good and he puts it up and it goes approximately 10 feet before it obliterates a tree and just smashes into (laughs) complete pieces you had a lemon dude that drone was a lemon that thing you would fly it straight and it would fly at a 45 degree angle and it would fly down at a 45 degree angle. It was a lemon, dude. It was no good. But then you were with uh it was was it you, Sobi, and Stolsky still on the water when he caught that like prehistoric was it a steelhead? It was an old steelhead. I feel like Sobi might have left. Or were you still with us? No, I no, me and Arello had left. Yeah, oh, it was just it was just it was just me, you and Stolsky, yeah. Yeah, I remember we got that. Um, yeah, that was a that was a good time. I think that was a time where I realized we got, I've got to be very careful what I say on my on my GoPros and stuff because I feel like Bart, you saw some footage that day that you probably shouldn't have seen, and it kind of affected some friendships that day. Do you remember that? Oh yeah, I now that you bring that up, yes. But yeah, that's been swept under the rug long time ago. But yes, <laughs> I just aired out some dirty laundry. But I feel like as friends, like sometimes stuff gets out that's not really meant to be said, and uh, it's just yeah, it's just bullshit. At the end of the day, I've I've reviewed some footage, and I've like I don't know, just like it's so weird when there's cameras rolling all the time, and you don't like it, it's good to be yourself. And I think it's hard to like I don't know to to just be able to like remember that there's cameras rolling all the time, but you also don't want to be like being fake and stuff. I don't know. It's just a weird thing. And I think I'm glad it didn't ruin any friendships and we were able to be bigger, bigger people about it. But uh, yeah, we caught a big steelhead and it made well, the video. You because caught we caught me the next day. What? Do you remember that? We got a lot Probably of grief the dumbest that. decision we ever made. Yeah, this was people still talk about that. That was definitely the dumbest cool. decision we all made. <laughs> it was like I think at, that at, I think that just shows you that as long as you're calm and collective and you'll be fine in a situation. We everything was fine. And nothing happened. I still think to this day it's fine. <laughs> what I do it again. For, for, <laughs> I'll, I'll, for, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. We'll we'll you now. For, <laughs> for people that don't know this story, break down what happened here. Yeah, so, let me let me let me break so down, break it down. part. So also like in the, I guess in, in the time and place in YouTube before this really, um, and, and way before I had worked with Al, like they would capture their adventures 
uh, basically say what it was, uh, put a thumbnail, something from it up there, kind of half ass, and it and it would roll. And that's because you know this this market of fishing or just online outdoor content on YouTube that it wasn't saturated yet. There wasn't much of it, and it would it would perform well. It would get good views. But at this point, now fast forward to the story we're about to tell, which is maybe what 2018. That was when I wasn't. Yeah, actually, yeah, I was probably around then. Yeah, Maybe that 17. was yeah, that was when we started really playing with thumbnails and titles more of videos, and and you know, as a collective, I'm not going to just throw this on Al. As a collective, we kind of thought, you know, if we caught a human being through an ice hole and got a picture of that, that video would get a million views, no doubt. If we put a hu- if we catch a Bart through a, an ice hole, and Al reels in Bart legitimately up through the bottom of a frozen lake. We're gonna get a million views, and we're gonna be, we're gonna be super. And it was one of those days where nothing, like it was one of those lakes that was super clean, and you get like a two-hour bite window. I, I, I really regret sometimes in my life just staying out there during the middle of the day for no apparent reason when there is an obvious bite window, especially during ice season, first light and last light. And it was one of those days where we just missed the morning bite, and. We'd been out there for six hours. Nothing had happened. We didn't have a video, and my mind started to race. And the idea was to put Bart under the ice. <laughs> so what? So what we did is we we cut a basically a giant spear hole in the shack, and then we had cut a night a, another giant spear hole outside of the shack. And what we were going to do is we were going to run a piece of rope underneath the shack through both the holes, and Adam was going to strip down basically to his skivvies. And th- mind you, we got, we're driving trucks out there. There's two feet of ice. So Adam was going to hold on to the rope and we were going to pull him underneath two feet of ice, probably six or eight feet. And he was going to pop up literally throughout the other side. So you, no, you we really were, we weren't going to, we weren't going to pull him. We had the, he had the line attached to him and then we had a rope on his foot. So if something went wrong, we were going to pull him back <laughs> up through his foot. We did have one, a safety one, valve. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't a good one. Down. I just but the goal love is the to get conversation the about this as you're like crapping. It's just got to be beautiful. <laughs> this is it was more you know, Stolsky. It's so safe, dude. It's so good. I think it was more Stolsky and Rello looking at me saying, "There's no way you're actually gonna do this," and Peric looking at me, "Do it, pussy. Do it. Do it. You won't do it." <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like setting up cameras, like, "This is the shot. We're only gonna be able to get the shot once." Like, I'm just worried about the production side of this. Like, get everything rolling. Because this is gonna pop up through here, and it's it's gonna look like Alex. To be honest, with, human. to be honest with you guys, this is like this might have what invented the cold plunge. Like Bart, you would, you pretty much are a pioneer in Think of all health it. That's what I and like wellness in the health and wellness sector of wow. YouTube. Like Wim Hof, Wim Hof watched that video and got all of his ideas straight from you, man. Like really, yeah. thank oh, you for sure. I yeah. do remember right before it went down, there was there, you know Adam is on the fence between no way I'm not, I'm not doing this ever. And okay, I'll do it. And, <laughs> and Parrot goes, I'll fly you down to Texas and you can golf down in Texas. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a free golf trip to Texas. If you do this. And Bart's like, at the time, you know, Adam loves golf. He's like, okay, deal. <laughs> also the dead of winter. And I haven't seen 70 okay. degrees in three months. Like, You'll fly me down I'm to like, Dallas and buy great. me a round of golf. He's like, yeah. I, I know that this so we so we baited me and told me that I don't have to take you golfing now because I'm going on this podcast, but I still will go golfing with you, Bart. If we ever have the opportunity to do it, I would love to go and I the round of golf is on me for sure. Yeah, we can we can take out the flight part. That's fine. But yeah, they pull me, they pull me through the ice. And it was just like we film and I immediately go, get me in a truck. And behind the scenes, we had a truck running for an hour with full heat. In retrospect, that probably wasn't the smartest idea because I got in there and it was like a shock of like going from a cold plunge to like a sauna. It was like a hundred degrees in there. It was, I, it was, it was nuts. We got the shot though, and it was, it turned out, it turned out. And the video is still on the internet, even though we got lots of bad comments and lots of like old industry people telling us that was stupid and you shouldn't show that. I. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I have a, I have a hard time like justifying taking videos offline, to be honest. I've kept pretty much everything up. Yeah. Like 
I've never taken any videos down. I know lots of content creators take them down. I just like roll with the punches. I'm like, screw it. I'll just keep it up. I don't care. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's a part of history. We will, we will still say we do not recommend doing this. No, <laughs> don't, don't it do was, it. It was we're, prof- we're professionals. <laughs> we're <trained> professionals. <laughs> if, if you are a professional and you enjoy cold water therapy, go for it. But we are not responsible for your death or your children's deaths. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but no, that led to a bunch more ice fishing trips for you. And I think uh, something that doesn't get talked about a bunch, ice camping became a major thing. You, Soby, and Spencer went and did some epic ice camping stuff in the middle of goddamn nowhere before that was ever a thing, and it was like negative a billion catching giant pike. What was that whole experience like? I'm going to tee off Al with, with, um, with a story. Where we went, I think from where I'm sitting, kind of in southern Minnesota, it's like 16 or 17 hours north of where I'm at. So like we were, we were freaking way up there in Canada. And you got to tell them about the McDonald's we stopped at in that town. <laughs> Do you remember that? It's it's the Paw, Manitoba, and it's truthfully one of the most beautiful places on earth. But I think when you like live there your whole life, and uh, there's definitely lots of alcohol alcohol issues up there, and it's hard. I don't know. It's just a hard place to live. Even though it's so beautiful, the days are short in the winter and it leads to, it leads to some things that are not like the greatest thing, greatest like uh, description of humans on earth. So anyways, I was in this mindset, which Sobe, I, I kind of want to apologize for. I feel like a lot of times the videos were like the number one thing. And I think I should have enjoyed the moment a little bit better, but I had to get a video uploaded. Like if we didn't have a video going up every two or three days, like something was wrong. It was bad. Like we needed a video up. So we drove 25 minutes to the nearest McDonald's to get Wi-Fi, And we sat down and here comes, we'll just say his name is Johnny. Here comes Johnny in and Johnny's crew and Johnny's crew looks like they've been drinking the cheapest vodka that they could get out of the water bottle, you know, and they were just hammered, just obliterately in this McDonald's hammered. And I remember Johnny and his old girl walking into the bathroom over there into the one stall bathroom. And Johnny's girl had a little smile on her face and Johnny was grinning ear to ear. And you could tell that he was smacking her booty as he went into this bathroom and some heinous things went on in that McDonald's bathroom. But Johnny, Johnny came out of the bathroom and he sat down and I've never seen this before. I've seen a grown man sit down after coming out of the bathroom, legs back, and he just started peeing with everybody around him. He just started peeing. And I think he, he had, no yeah, room. he just, he just pissed and passed out right there in, in and then right. on like the chair and then on the floor of McDonald's. And this is at like midnight and there's rough crowd. Every, it wasn't just John and Johnny wasn't out of place. Mind you, he would have blended into the rest of the crowd that was really. We were out of place. We were out of place. Yeah. And we're in there with a laptop and it's just me and Al and we've got all our computer stuff, which is really expensive in this, you know, definitely a little rougher part of of where we were. And it was, it was, I could paint you just probably a a scarier picture. And the fact that we didn't get robbed is unbelievable. But I remember like, you know, you get those gut feelings like, dude, we got to get the hell out of here. Like we have, do we got to leave? It was like, even, <laughs> even Al adventurous Al, when he was 19 years old, he had that feeling like dude, we got to get the hell out of here. Like, <laughs> and J- Johnny, like the McDonald's employees, like, what are you doing? I'm calling the cops. And the cops came and the cops knew who Johnny was and was like, what the heck are you doing? Johnny? Like, is this the fourth time I've kicked you out of this McDonald's this week? Like they all knew each other. It was just good old small town vibes, but that was the first time I ever seen a dude in a public area, just start peeing himself and pass out just in the McDonald's and have a pool of piss next to him in the McDonald's. It was crazy. (laughs) Like laying on the floor. Yeah. This is incredible. Oh, but but the 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 ice ice fishing, Sobe, because you guys did ice (laughs) camping before anybody did it. Yeah. It's a very good side story. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I remember it being so cold up there. Some of the days when we were, when we were ice camping for those pike. And I just remember, Alex and Spencer at each other's throats, man. Like I just, it was like every day I was like, someone's going to die out here and I'll be a witness. And then I'm going to have to testify. 
And I don't know which one of them is going to die or which one's going to kill the other, but someone's going to die. And then I have to, I have to, I, I don't know. Do I take, do, do I, do I write this story down? Like, what do I do? You know what I mean? I know I'm going to see this in court someday and I'll have to testify when the other one goes to jail for manslaughter. <laughs> it was nuts. Tell some of those of you and Spencer at each other's throats. All I remember is like, I wanted to hold up the fish I caught. And Spencer was like, you're not tough enough to hold up the fish. So he wanted to like hold up my fish for me for the video. And I was like, just let me hold it up. And he was like, no. And I was like, let me hold it up. And we had to like, I don't know. We got into a bickering match about that. I remember how cold it was. We had two big Mr. Buddies going all night in the house. And we still were freezing. Like it was negative 35 degrees real temperature out there, which was insane. But there was nothing better than once we came back on that trip. We caught Pike. We caught a big lake trout. We got back to the truck, and um, Dan and Shay Tequila started playing. And we, like, bumped up the music, and it was just, like, the most euphoric thing I've ever experienced in my life. Yeah. Like, it was just like, like we made it. You know what I mean? Like, it felt like when those troops got off, off the helicopter, the plane from Vietnam. Like they made it back. <laughs> and we looked at each other I, don't, like, I don't know if it was that, I don't know if it was that intense, but yeah, maybe it was that intense. <laughs> Had to been close. First Obi. <laughs> it's like same thing. Same Everyone's thing. alive. <laughs> oh, I have one major regret from that trip. That might be honestly one of my biggest regrets ever. Um, and it's because I was being a wuss and it was so damn cold in the middle of the night on one of those freaking absolute rager of a cold nights that we we're sleeping out there. I think I think Alex or Spencer goes outside to take a piss and they say, Oh my God, get out here. These are some of the most beautiful Northern lights like ever, like, like you are way, way up North where it would actually happen. And I think on just a really, really calm, extremely cold night, maybe they're just out and about to the next level. And then I know Al or Spencer went out there and I was so freaking cold. I never went outside, but Alex, I remember you just saying, those are the sickest Northern lights you ever saw. The Northern lights are super cool. I, I've never been able to capture them with a camera, but every time I look at it through my actual eyes, I just, it, it, it seems like there's aliens in the world, like playing on a projector with the lights. It doesn't look real, but yeah, they, when you get up North, I, I went there last year. I actually rented a cabin in the Paw for a month and lived up there by myself. Uh, During ice winter. fishing. Yeah. That's where I filmed. Uh, there's like a video, like three days in an ice house alone. And I like got, I caught those, pike in that spot on a jigging bait and i got him to come up it was it was crazy um is the but, water that clear there that water was that clear oh yeah i drilled a sight hole um Sick. it was it was really dumb thinking about it because i went there by myself and there was i got my snowmobile stuck a couple times and i thought i was gonna just like perish out there or whatever like when you're by yourself going on those big ice fishing trips it's just not that fun you need you need to have somebody with you just in case something goes wrong but uh yeah that place is incredible the fishing up there is so good untouched and yeah i hope it stays that way for eternity i think well, it will with, yeah with the ice fishing i think then where pink comes in and me to you is the good old saint paul ice show there was one year where it was like industry moving i think when you guys started frostbite and you guys had like the first ice fishing meetup at the St. Paul ice show. And basically I feel like I met Ryan at the meetup at storm brothers with Mav. I definitely was that wasn't not true? there. I wasn't there. I, at, I didn't after meet... we went to, di we went to dinner with you after no, the second well, maybe one that was with, maybe I that don't was think so. I don't... Yeah. Maybe? Cause I, I, I didn't actually meet you until at St. Paul when you guys were like, uh, yeah, like you had just launched frostbite and and i think sam was like oh dude you should you should come down and i was like oh, i'll help i'll help or whatever and i helped you guys like build the booth and stuff at st paul and then i just hung out like the rest of the weekend or because you had you had gotten that sick airbnb right downtown and we all stayed there oh yeah so that, that was, airbnb that was, was time yeah that was so sick that airbnb was incredible that was unreal that was <laughs> that was a cool one that was worth every penny we paid for that uh, but i think yeah. You you definitely came to the Thorn Brothers meetup in February after that big storm. The the Natty of well, that, North Nights. Yes, 
when I, I was, was there. that was in March because I was down in uh, that would have been Mill after fishing in national. That yeah, was, that was after, after. I feel, that I feel been like after. I was mixing. I feel okay. like I was mixing that up, but I feel like you were there then too. Maybe that sounds right. That sounds right. That would have been after. Yeah. Yeah, I was not in attendance for that one. That was, it was a scary night. <laughs> yeah, but no, but, that uh, St. Paul Ice Show was like, I think that's what you wanted to get into, Bart, right? Yeah. No, well, they were talking about the Airbnb. If you yeah. think back to the people who were in that Airbnb at that time, it's pretty mental, like in terms of YouTube and like ice fishing and everything. Like it was like Peric and then uh, Weeb, Sobe. Murray, Murray, Ryan, me, Brock, Brock um, Mav. And I think yeah. a, like a bunch Rello. of people were rolling in and out of there. It was such a complex of a place. Well, and this I place remember... had an elevator with, I think, three different levels. It was a Dude, complex. That... It was the sickest yeah. Airbnb ever. Yeah. And it was like pretty early. Because, I mean, I remember like that first night there, I remember like everyone was getting pretty drunk or whatever. And that was like Murray hit 10K subs that night. And everyone was like pretty psyched about it, you know? Yeah, that was looking, like, yeah, looking back on that night. And it's like, I mean, that meetup at St. Paul, the line was unbelievable. And I guess, Alex, with like being there for that and the launch of Frostbite and everything, like what was that whole deal getting into like the whole ice game? And then, I mean, too, like, has it ever gotten old, like having those meetups and just being like, oh, my God, there's so many people here. This is crazy. I think that was definitely like my prime maybe was during that time because <laughs> everybody was just hyped on what I was doing. Like it was, it was like, yeah, my story being told was very, very good. Thanks to Sam Sobey who's on this call with us. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's a crazy feeling to think people want to show up to talk to you. I've never been somebody who wanted to really be famous. I don't think, I think I just, enjoyed fishing and it was like i have to get a job so i'm gonna do it i never really wanted to become famous but those moments make me feel like i was like somewhat famous like people wanted to see me and talk to me and take pictures with me and have me sign something like i just never thought somebody would want my autograph i just it just never clicked in my head that's what was gonna happen but uh yeah that meetup was crazy i remember we had a line for three hours like just constant yeah. people trying to come to our booth and hundreds, hundreds, up the, hundreds, hundreds of people were, were lined up. It was incredible. And it I wasn't just, just like, them. it wasn't just well, like ahead, people were trying to t take pictures. I mean, there's like, there's like children having like mental breakdowns next to this booth because you're, you, you're there. So this wasn't just like, Oh, like, let's take some pics. Like, this is like, just like disrupting the event kind of thing. And you somehow got Weeb to come out of Canada. Like, we yeah. made a public appearance. Like, has that, he, has that he, doesn't happen. Has he done a show or anything like that since, like in the States, or done, been in a public appearance in the United he, States? He did then? go to the Winnipeg Ice Show, after, not last year, the year before he was there, but he didn't go last year. And I think that, and I don't know if he talked about it, but he definitely talked about the St. Paul one. And, yeah, that was crazy to get Weeb to come. We wait, Weeb came the next year too. Did yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He came two years in a row. I don't think he's gonna come this year. But what I was gonna say is I just signed the paperwork for this year. So I'm going to the St. Paul Ice Show this year. Are you upper level or lower level? You're not sure. Shit, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> What's going well, on in Airbnb? We're gonna we're gonna have to have some beers together again. Yeah, right, right on. on. Uh, yeah, level. going in on an Airbnb again. Oh God, that same <laughs> one is still there. I think someone was looking at renting it last year. The same one is still there. Oh, is it really? God, that that place it's, looks good. It's got to be just. It was. It was expensive back then, but it wasn't like crazy expensive. It's got to be so expensive now. It's, it's got to like, be now. It's going. Yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. But then, like you were talking about, Peric, with that kind of being at your peak and everything. I mean, as far as you want to dive into it, but then obviously like the hey, videos. Hey, I'm slow. not at my peak. I'm not actually at my peak. I'm at my peak right now. I'm always yeah. going to be climbing the mountain taller. But <laughs> as far as like maybe popularity YouTube. on YouTube yeah. goes, yeah. Yeah. So then the YouTube video slow and like, I mean, you took a break and everything for a bit. Like kind of what was that process and like what went on there? The process of taking a break. 
Yeah, well, like, I mean, obviously, you're making all these ice videos and everything, and then everything YouTube-wise starts to slow down, and then you kind of, I mean, lack of a better term, vanish for a while. Yeah. Like, what what was kind of going on as far, like I said, as far as you want to go into it, but in the brain, or like, did you just run into that burnout that eventually chases, like, all the content creators, or what was kind of going on? Yeah, I think I just, I think I did YouTube just like when you're growing up in high school and you guys could probably relate to this, like you go to high school and then you're taught, you have to go to college and then you're taught once you go to college, you need a job. And my thought process was the reason why I was getting the job was I need to make enough money to afford a house. Like I need to be able to afford enough money to pay for my mortgage and I think it got to the point where I saved some money up and I felt like I could take a break from my job. And I had never experienced what a break was like because I don't like I don't think like that. I think either I'm doing it or I'm not doing it. So when I stopped doing it, it was just really hard to start back up. It's one of those things where once you stop, you don't know if people are going to watch you again. You don't know what people want. You don't know why you're doing it. You've just like, I don't know. Casey Neistat explained it really well in a video where he, where he said yeah. like, he didn't remember when he was daily vlogging, he like did all of these videos and then he stopped and he like felt like he wasn't alive during that time when he was making those videos. Cause he like never had time to think. And I think I did a lot of overthinking during the time when I wasn't posting videos and it led to, we're in the upper level at St. Paul, by the way. And it led to just, yeah, burnout, I think is probably the great, the great way to say this. And then I met somebody who I went to New Zealand with, and it was kind of nice to have a co-host that was just really nice to me. And I connected with, and she definitely helped me make videos again. So thanks Sydney, if you're watching this. Yeah, for sure. So then like during that break, like, was it refreshing? Like getting, I mean, you see it now, like, I mean, we're doing the Chronicles, Sobey's doing his own thing, like, we're still all pounding the pavement, but still, like, call Sobey randomly and be like, I'm I'm one week away, man. I don't know how long. And then you just get recharged up and you go do it and get excited. But what was it like? Like, what did you do during that time? Did you enjoy it or, like, you trying to get back after it? I think with my personality, it was hard for me to enjoy the break because I felt like I was losing everything I spent my whole life trying to build. So it was like, I just felt like I was throwing everything away. Just like, what am I doing? This is so dumb. I got to go back and make some sick videos. And even though I vanished every, you know, I think my longest stunt was like eight months. I'd come back with a video that I thought was like really good. And that was kind of cool because it wasn't like I was just trying to upload anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I <sighs> I don't even know, man, like I'm getting less YouTube views than when I started back in 2016. So it's definitely doesn't YouTube doesn't favor breaks. That's one thing that uh, it definitely doesn't favor is breaks. Oh, for sure. No. And with that, I mean, I guess ever. Well, I'll just dive into this and we can do whatever we want about this. But with this, obviously you and Sobe have not been on a public thing in forever. How long, whatever happened with that whole deal, you guys want to talk about like how that split and everything went. Sobe went on his own thing, which you did, how that whole situation went down to whatever level you want to like, that was a, I mean, obviously you see the comments forever. I know Sobe has had people wanting you guys to fish together and obviously we're here and you guys are buds. That's going to be a shock to a lot of people. <laughs> I, think, I think Al explained it good, though. Like, for so long, he had his foot to the floor gas, you know what I mean, all the way. And it's just like he was he was doing so much. We were doing so much, but especially him because they were, oh, my gosh, all the different brands that he was kind of partially overseeing while – running kind of a, a YouTube channel down South being the Guggen squad while managing his YouTube channel and starting new business ventures. And then, you know, just the normal pressures of life and everything else. It's like, he, he had an incredible amount of pressure at a really, really young age, you know? And I, and I think, I just think it, I, I think it was a ton, you know what I mean? A ton of, a ton of work and a ton of stuff to manage. And I think, yeah, 
that just, I, I, I don't know. I think it was really, really tough for Al to manage. And it's not like he had, like he had teammates around him, but like, you know, he was a kid and we were all kids. We didn't really know what we we're doing. You know what I mean? It was just full gas. And I think, yeah, when it came I, down, it really just, I, there was so much going on. I agree with that. I agree. There's a lot going on. I think that even now I'm going through some stuff where like I'm setting up a new company with a couple friends and I know so much more about business and how to do things because of what has happened. But I think so be if, there was some sort of non-compete and we had an actual contract together. I feel like things might not have ended the way they ended, but I, my biggest fear was always you going and starting your own thing. And that's exactly what you did. So it just, it rubbed me the wrong way. I think if now I don't care because I want everybody to be successful and I don't think it's like as much um, as like, competition like i don't see people as competition i see them as like growing the sport and all on the same team but back then there was definitely a vibe where like i didn't want to grow other people because i felt like i was being used like it's just so hard when you have some sort of following that you don't know if people are surrounding you because they want to leech off of you or because they generally like being around you or whatever and i just i felt like when you and mav left it just immediately you both were starting youtube channels and it was like always my biggest fear when i was like trying to find a cameraman and, and figure this stuff out, but it was probably for the better. I mean, there's no hard feelings now. And I don't really, I don't, I definitely don't care anymore. And I would go fishing with you. We've gone fishing together since we just didn't film that day with yeah. Mav. Um, But yeah, that was my side of the story. Why I didn't really connect with you after was, I just felt like I got backstabbed is such a generic word, but that's kind of how I felt. So. Yeah. Oh, and I, just want to, sure. I just want to jump in here real quick and like, I mean, from like my perspective, right. Because I full just like, I don't, I didn't, I didn't meet, look, meet you or have like that great relationship with you, like before or even after, like, you know, the few times we've met Alex and uh, like, I, just from my perspective, kind of watching everything play out the way that it has and to see where you are now, it, it was like, it's badass to kind of see like how far on like the, I mean, I know the videos and all that is, you know, what people see and, and appreciate and all that, but like the business side of what you've been able to accomplish is honestly super, you know, I mean, that's badass. Like, I feel like you've, you've figured out a lot of stuff, especially early on that, you know, there's a lot of people that have never gotten to that level or, or whatever. And, and just like the entrepreneurial side of like what the outdoor industry is, like you've been able to capitalize on that a lot. For sure. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, I think as I become a little bit more mature, I realize all these situations that at the time seemed like the end of me and the worst thing possible. <laughs> they just, they added a new chapter to my book and they added uh, new life experiences that I use every day now. So there's no hard feelings with anything that happened between Sobe and Mav and Murray. Honestly, I feel like Murray got the shortest end of the stick because he was just lumped into all that and he should have never been lumped into everything. I, I really miss Murda and I wish I, I, I need to go fishing with him sometime. And um, yeah, I don't know. It just, it's just a weird time in my life. You said it good, Sobe. It's just, yeah. I think, well, I don't I know think, if you want to touch more on it, but no, you're good. Just to add on that AP, I was going to say one thing I felt like we always had and like, you know, chatting now was when we were young and at that time filming, like, I felt like our group had such a great relationship <clears throat> with you and you fit into our group so well, because we were all just friends going fishing. Like we didn't care about like Alex Parrick's, you know, 600,000 subs, whatever it was. We're just like, dude, do you want to go film this sick crappie bite? Or do you want to go film this? And we just had genuine fun with each other. And I think that led to a lot of great things and great l- relationships between all of us. That was kind of, that's sure. kind of the beauty of, of also like it was, it had been done in freshwater a little bit, but especially in the ice fishing side, like that was kind of the beauty of, of Alex's channel because he was one of the first really, really big ice fishing channels besides a weeb or, or like Jay. Um, because it wasn't like such a sponsor driven TV show that it was kind of just real authentic, genuine ice fishing content and fishing content with camaraderie and, and buddies. And, and that's like, I think what captured so many people and kind of changed that ice fishing industry when they did have that meetup, Alan Weeb, it was just like, it was kind of monumental. 
because that hadn't really been done in that industry in that facet before. So yeah, it's just, it's nuts. And it's so, it, it seems like so much happened in honestly, like, like a two and a half to yeah, two and a half, three years span, you know, I feel like you live 10 lifetimes. Yeah. And, and Al's, yeah. Pro- Al's probably felt like he's lived 20 lifetimes by now. <laughs> I was going to say everything we've talked about in this whole thing so far, it's crazy to think about that. That pretty much all has happened in the last five years. Yeah. Literally all of that. Yeah. No, it's crazy. <laughs> and with, with the kind of camaraderie stuff, Alex, I do have to bring this up because this is another bet you and I had, but I, I great, know. Yeah. I, oh yeah. I, here we go. Our I great mean, camaraderie I, uh, and everything <laughs> led to you and Sobe fishing the St. Jude Bass Classic against uh, me and Fiedler at the time. And we had a bet for Sobe. Do you remember what the bet was? Yeah, it was um, – Al and I had a pretty decent practice. I want to say he just flew in from somewhere, and we kind of got on a little something, and we had never really fished the Mississippi or those pools before, but we kind of got on a little something, and then we kind of – we did pretty good day one. We kind of crushed him day one and Adam kind of shit the bed. And, and that was when it was like legit. Al's like, you know, Adam's like, I'm going to catch 20 some pounds tomorrow. And Alex is like, no way in hell. You got like 10 pounds today. Dude, it's never going to happen. And, and I don't know what place we're going to get, but we were going to murder you three ways till Tuesday. Yeah. And the <laughs> and, bet was, and the bet was the loser either has to put a fat head. St- and the bet was between Alex and Bart. I, I, me and Feeler weren't even in this. The loser has to either put a fat head sticker of the other person's face on the cowling of their motor or just wear a jersey to a big time tournament like a Sturgeon Bay Open with the other person's face uh, as the jersey. So <laughs> it was really a good a great shame bet. It was it was a great bet and after day 1 they had like 17 and a half and I think we had 15 and a half. And we had pulled into a spot and caught a four pound pre-spawn female that had just moved in. And yeah, we got back to the hotel and I said, I don't care what you caught today. You guys better catch 21 tomorrow. Cause I'm going to whale them. Yeah. And then we and did. You did well. Yeah, you did well. <laughs> you did well. And so, I still have to get that shirt and uh, I got to sign up for a big tournament. <laughs> yeah. It's going to happen. So if you send me a PDF of your face, which you want, I'll, I'll get the Jersey made up. So I got it ready. <laughs> that would, lock it that in would be a good one lock yeah we in. can do that we'll, we'll we'll get rid of the flight to texas you and i'll go golfing <laughs> as friends and stuff but like we can't let that one slide that was way too good no 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 that's we're, a juicy we're not one. letting that slide that is one no. thing in my life that i'm i'm trying to uh you, all you have is your word right and i don't want to be a freaking liar or a scumbag so i i gotta <laughs> i gotta keep up with my bets i don't want to be known as that guy who stank down of all, all of his bets you know no for one sure th- and so you talked about it a little bit earlier. You had said you had sold some of your shares of Guggen Bates and stuff back in 2020 or what, whatever that had been to private equity and stuff. And I just have to ask this question because I've heard it on other podcasts and stuff with like NFL players and all that. But like, dude, you had to have bought something really cool when you did that, right? Like there was there was one thing you bought that you were like, I earned this. I'm going to buy something really dumb. What was that thing? I took the entire paycheck and I threw it in the a- index at a th- and made a ton of money off it and then i sold that and i put it into government bonds in 2021 and i haven't touched it since that's you, freaking awesome that is you are a smart that man is freaking you, didn't awesome. buy, you didn't buy one thing i i did buy a tesla um in the summer of 2021 but it it wasn't that cool. I, I the interest rates were two point eight percent, so I have a monthly car payment on that, and I do have a Tesla Model X that will tow my boat. And I haven't really put in any videos because I'm not a big car guy. But no, I I haven't bought anything. I still don't have a house that's mine. I don't have um, yeah, I don't I don't have anything really possession wise other than my boat and a lot of unused fishing lures that i tend to like spend way too much money on but uh i'm not i'm not yeah (laughs) that's badass though that is super badass yeah yeah that's super cool um with that like i had seen did you guys posted something never stop three got filmed right yeah never stop three got filmed it took us 43 days to film it um we caught 30 
we got 37 different fish species. We started at the tip of Key West and we ended all the way up in New Brunswick, Canada. So we went up the entire East Coast, caught a fish in every single state along the East Coast, and we caught some pretty big ones too. So I think, I believe it, the first one drops October 1st. Um, but don't hold me to that. John, I bought a, I bought a car. I was telling this on my podcast, Sydney and I filmed the podcast two days ago and I was editing it today. So this story is going to be on both podcasts, but I bought a car from John that he bought off our Facebook marketplace, like a rundown old 1997 car. And it took me a month to pay John and John is pissed at me right now. So I'm trying to get John to talk to me again. And I don't know, um, if we're going to drop the episodes October 1st, but the last thing I know is eight episodes have been finished and we're waiting to finish the last two. So did Wes film and edit it? Wes filmed it all. And Alex Blackwell did all the editing. Oh, oh my God. Beautiful. Oh my God. Beautiful. It's incredible. And Wes yeah. did the trailer and he did the final edits too on it. So it, Wes definitely had his hand in the mix on it. Oh, that'll be sick that having all you guys involved in that'll be very, very good. And well, I was going to ask, obviously you still have great. Well, I was thinking you had a great relationship with John, but here we are still got a relationship <laughs> with John. You guys film never stop three and everything. You still chatting with all the other boys or kind of what's going on there. I saw Rackley this year and we fished OH Ivy, which is like the most popular lake in Texas right now, just going off for big bass. Um, we did a little series, me, John, and him filmed down there. And then I talked to Flair every once in a while, just drop him a text. I was, I was, I killed a Marion Turkey, Merriam Turkey this spring, and I was looking at like turkey uh, displays on Etsy. And the third one down was like a th- a flare thumbnail somebody was using a flare thumbnail as their etsy (laughs) promo and it was him like with his turkey going like this or whatever so i sent him that that was pretty funny even mike mike loves to trade stocks too um i love trading stocks so it's cool to talk to somebody about that i wouldn't say i'm like an active day trader or anything i've lost a lot of money this year trading so um this has been my worst year for sure everybody else is killing it i've made some uh, poor decisions on that front, but my original money's good in my government bonds, which is, which is nice. And uh, money isn't everything, but I do enjoy investing and I enjoy reading um, just all sorts of documents about businesses and how they're functioning, how they use their capital and how to use the tax system to your advantage, I think is very interesting topics to me. So Mike's always a good person to talk about with that. Cause I think he's got that same kind of uh, brain as I do. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't talk to Kendrick anymore. That's kind of a sad one. Uh, he he called us on Never Stop one day. John and I got a little wild the day before Never Stop, and we woke up and we almost we almost canceled it because it was a very rough first night. We before we even started filming, we like went out. I lost my phone. It was just a whole disaster. Oh my. <laughs> but how uh, could how could yeah. how could you start any other way though? I mean, like might as well. <laughs> it's never a dull moment i feel like when john and i get together but uh yeah it's it's i'm always trying to maintain relationships with people and sometimes it's just it's just hard people just go separate ways and it's uh you just gotta let go and figure it out and other times you get drawn back to people because of uh connection so it's cool yeah for sure and like you've mentioned a little bit or so but you got something yeah i do so like well obviously you're doing a ton of hunting right now and you've done a ton of fishing and you've done a ton of fishing series. You've done a lot of filming of these series. Like, what do you, what do you think you like the best right now? Do you like, do you like the finished product the best? Do you like filming it? Do you like, do you like podcast the best? Do you like hunting the best? Do you like fishing the best? Do you like being alone the best? Or like, what do you like? What if it doesn't have to be specific, but like, what do you like the best right now? And then maybe what do you reflect on and be like, that's what I really enjoyed the most. Amazing question. I don't know what, at what point my mic died, but my mic died. You still got pretty good chain? Oh, it's still good. Okay. It's yeah, still good. It's still better good. now. Okay. Let me just see something. Yeah. All right. How's it sound now? Oh, wow. that sounds good. That's Very hot. crisp. <laughs> what, what time did it end at? What the heck? Okay, I just refixed my mic for everybody watching. 
I'm not good with technology. I would say my favorite part, it's definitely, I don't, I talked to Clayton Schick today and I'm just bringing this up because he says he films his best stuff when he's alone. And I do feel like I film some good stuff when I'm alone, but being alone is not always like, I don't know. It's not always the greatest thing. It For video, it's great because the viewer gets to see raw you and it gets to connect with you on a really deep level. But for like, personally, I don't, it's not like I enjoy being alone all the time. Um, I enjoy filming with other people. I enjoy being outside. I don't think it has to be like fishing or hunting. Even I think it's just being outside. I went on a nice date yesterday. Yesterday was Sunday. Yeah. And we woke up like at sunrise and we just hiked a bunch of rivers and I was just trying to find some salmon that I could see. Cause I wanted her to catch one. Um, and I wanted like, I wanted to see it cause I knew if I could see it, she'd be able to catch it because they're like super dumb this time of year. And we didn't end up catching one, but we hiked all day long. and just went to a bunch of cool spots and it was just like such a good day for me because I was outside the whole day. I can definitely feel when I'm in the sun or when I'm outside versus when I'm inside, like editing at the end of the day, it's like, it's hard for me to fall asleep and I don't feel like I had a fulfilling day, but for yeah, sure. I would say anything outside. It doesn't have to be fishing or hunting. It could be looking for morel mushrooms. It could be looking for sheds. It could be going down a beach and looking at the water. Just being outside definitely is where I belong. I got gotcha. you. Are you watching anything right now on YouTube? Or like, are you out of that whole loop? Or are you watching anything really cool? Because I always think it's interesting to just see who's making the next six series or who's making the new innovative content and stuff like that, you know? For sure. I am a I am a YouTube fiend. I really enjoy watching YouTube videos. Um, even when I took a break, I was always still watching them. Um, I'm just looking at my homepage. The Hunting Public. I watch a lot of their stuff. They're they're really good. Um, Sobe and I got to hunt with a couple of them. I actually went turkey hunting with Logan this spring, Sobe and uh That's it. Yeah, we didn't get one. I missed one. He reaped one in at 12 yards for me, and I freaking missed with my bow. Um, just freaked out. I freak out, man. It's really hard for me with hunting. I just <laughs> freak out. <laughs> I do like, uh, I, like, I feel like you're, you get a wicked rush from hunting versus fishing at this point in your life right now. I fishing the, you, you, it, you don't get to see the, the, like, I guess with live scope, you do get to see like the fish coming and you get that initial rush. But like with hunting, when that deer comes in, it could be 45 minutes where you're sitting there waiting yeah. to get the perfect shot, especially when you're bow hunting or spear hunting. And it's just, it's freaking, yeah, it's different. It's definitely different for sure. And I, I love eating meat. I love food. So I really, I really enjoy hunting. I hate how it has such a bad rap on the internet and about how like, I don't know, I'm worried to post a bunch of stuff because I don't want my channel to be flagged as like, whatever you, 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 you see that stuff on the internet where it's yeah. like you, but I'm still going to post it. I got some cool videos coming out. Um, so, since like, we're on, Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I was, I was just going to, I was just going to say some random YouTube channels, but go yeah, ahead. I was just going to say, since we're on the topic of it right now of the hunting stuff, I just wanted to break. So like, I mean, you've done a ton of fishing and I know like you did that growing up and everything and you've done some hunting or whatever, but now to be in a spot now where like, you know, you're able to learn from arguably one of the most proficient hunters like on planet earth in Tim Wells that, I mean, like you're doing some pretty cool stuff. I mean, that's like not just going out, you know, hanging in a tree stand looking for whitetails. Yeah. Besides just like having happy days with Tim, <laughs> do you feel like after you've hunted with him now a year or two that you're just like, wow, going back to where, where we were filming deer hunts back in the day, like you would look at the land totally different now. Or the oh approach? yeah, for sure. For sure, I would look at everything totally different. <laughs> um, but whitetail hunting, I still love. It's freaking awesome, and I like sitting in a tree. I was talking to this other friend of mine who, like, she, she grew up in the Midwest in Wisconsin, but she's, like, chasing mule deer out west right now. And she, like, says she's never going to go back out back to, like, whitetail hunting because she loves being on her feet, and she loves the spawn stalks. And I love the spawn stalks. I've done quite a bit of spawn and stalking in all sorts of countries. But man, there is something nice about just sitting in a tree and waiting for a whitetail to come <laughs> by and just sitting on a good old rub rub line or some scrapes or just where a pinch point where you know they're coming through and you have a good shot at something. Um, 
I I love whitetail hunting. And yeah, Miss Mr. Timothy Wells is even besides the hunting, the man is a driven mother. You know, like he just he goes, he goes, he hunts harder than anybody else at these camps. He is always trying to get content. Like the dude just does not stop and he's really inspiring and I'm very lucky to be able to surround myself with him. And uh yeah, he's he's out right now in Saskatchewan trying to he was going there to try and spear an elk, but I guess the conditions aren't really that great. I just talked to him this morning and he said uh, he did have a shot at a moose, though. He's trying to kill a moose or an elk in northern Saskatchewan. So I'm sure those with videos are going to be sick. He went there with the spear in mind, but he said it's not going to set up. Like, yeah, I've noticed with a lot of these trips, like, uh, it's just like you think you're going to go do something and then it ends up like, it's never as easy as you think it is like, Oh, these Especially animals are going to be here during this time. Yeah. It's just, it's just not that easy. It's uh, but he's definitely around some big bulls. I've seen some pictures. So that's, you- that's an interesting thing. Obviously he's a little different than a content creator or a YouTuber per se, but kind of been, he's been a content creator in the outdoors for how many years? 30 years, maybe more I, long time. I think it's, 30 or 40 years like he's been making content for the outdoor channel and sportsman's channel do you ever ask him like has has he ever gotten sick for it like or like sick of it because he still seems sick for it like you yes. said i i wasn't around when he was sick for it but um he definitely told me that he got burnt out from it and it's hard because he doesn't enjoy he wasn't enjoying the hunting as much as he he used to he was just trying to get footage for his tv show and stuff so he told me he got burnt out i don't know when it was and what the repercussions are from it but he also is one of the only people on tv that i feel like he mostly films all of his stuff himself he edits all of himself himself and he sends all the tv stuff to the tv pro like he doesn't have an editor he doesn't have a filmer he does it all himself the guy's insane that's crazy (laughs) that's and he runs his youtube and he runs his YouTube channel and he runs his Facebook page. Um, he's, he's the like such a hard worker. It's, it's pretty crazy. But Sydney was also saying that she like felt her dad losing interest in it. And it was like a hard time, but I guess he like figured it out and just did more trips that he was passionate about and not just trying to like film a TV show. He, he did it because he wanted to go do it. So. Cool. You were saying you got more videos coming and stuff. Do you got more of that hunting stuff? Cause I was telling, I've told Sam for a long time, like I don't really hunt, but I always really enjoyed your guys's when it was a fall and you'd go to your place in Wisconsin and do those whitetail <coughs> hunts and all that sort of stuff. Like it was cool to watch. Like they're very cool stories to tell. I think. For sure. Yeah. I, um, I have a max me and, Tim went to Mexico for 10 days and we lived in the jungle trying to shoot oscillated turkeys. I have that show coming out. That's edited on my channel. Um, I got to just post that, uh, New Zealand. I never even edited my New Zealand stuff. I got a giant stag with my bow. I killed a fallow deer. That's sick. Um, I haven't even touched that footage. Africa. I speared four different animals and shot two with my bow. I shot in, elon at 78 yards which is my longest bow kill so i got all that footage uh i just shot an antelope in wyoming i have all that footage i have a lot of footage i just got to go to that i got an editor that's working on some stuff but (laughs) i filmed so much over the past year like i've that's awesome yeah so i've got some cool stuff coming but i'm also worried about posting the hunting stuff on youtube because my channel is kind of in a weird spot um I'm not, I'm losing subscribers right now. So it's, um, I don't know if it's because I, because of my attitude or because of the lack of content and not explaining why I took a break, but I'm trying to turn my YouTube channel around before I hit it with a bunch of hunting stuff that will just really destroy it. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you still, are you still hunting with uh, Sam Dice a bit? Cause I know he was still on the white tail grind pretty hard. It looked like. Yes. Um, for, so I'm not an Illinois resident, so I'm only allowed one buck tag. So last year I killed the buck at Tim's place. Um, this year, I'm actually tomorrow morning, I'm waking up and going to look at some land in Wisconsin that may be my new home potentially. I, 
I've been looking at lots of property. I just haven't found anything that's really like where I could see myself settling down, but this is kind of near green Bay. And I think I really like green Bay. I love walleye fishing. I love musky fishing and the salmon fishing is just awesome there too. So I'm, I'm looking at a property over there. That's a little bit of acreage for some whitetails. And I know Sam's going to hunt with me if I, if I end up getting that, but, uh, that's awesome. Sam's ready. He's been practicing. I was, I, I fire my bow every day, so I'm ready. So with what you were saying and getting back after it, you got a bunch of footage and all that stuff. We've seen, I mean, I think we've all seen you're doing, you've talked about Sydney, you're doing some stuff with Barstool, getting more out there and stuff. Like, what is that whole experience like from going from like, you know, the Guggen Squad stuff to all of a sudden like Barstool? Um, like getting involved with that and just shooting all that. Has it been pretty cool or like, what's that like? Yeah, it never felt, it felt a lot different because it was just like Sydney and I, and then sometimes her cameraman, Sean, who um, he actually isn't from my hometown and Sam and Sean went to school together in grade school. So I kind of like knew who Sean was. So it never felt like it was a serious program or anything like that. And then all of a sudden, like, I don't know. It was crazy because the videos were getting like a hundred to 200,000 views every single one we posted. And it was like, wow, people really enjoy this stuff. And yeah, I potentially was going to go like try and get a job at Barstool and create some content, but I'm glad that wasn't the road I went down because I don't want a job. I just don't want a job. I like what I'm doing. I don't need a job. I don't need to have a boss. I think me being my own boss is probably the best thing for me right now. And I like the relationship that Cindy and I, Cindy and I have, and she just texted me now. She, I think we're going to go to her farm tomorrow night and shoot some more content and just set up some tree stands and stuff. So, um, it's not a job. I don't get paid by barstool. It's more of just me enjoying being outdoors and hanging out with Sydney. So, yeah. No, that's awesome. And it's, I mean, for all of us, I think it's been good to see you getting out doing everything again. Cause you know, for a while we were like, is Perry going to make videos anymore? Or is he good? Or like, what's going on? You know, for sure. I, and I, I just, I think it's hard for me to really uh, put into words why I took a break, but it's hard to make content when you're not like, when you don't have a direction. So I just didn't want to just put out a bunch of stuff that I was trying to get views for. I wanted to have a direction in my life. And I feel like I'm slowly getting to where like I have a clear direction. And also I think you can say editing, editing can be fun, but editing kind of sucks. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like Al, if you had a, an editor that would just like rifle out all your stuff, like, like if you got home and just, poof, just popped it out, like, you know what I mean? If you, if he knew the direction to take it, if he knew everything that happened on the trip and he could just fire that stuff out, I, I guarantee you go out freaking and film and you do stuff more than anybody else on the whole damn internet. Editing, editing sucks. And Adam knows that. And Ryan knows that. And, and I know it as well. It's just like, it, it like I've even got a ton of shit in the vault that it's like, I don't know if I'll ever make that in anything. I probably won't shit. It gets buried. You go on, life goes on and you're just like, and then you sit back and you're like, damn, like I've got all this different stuff in the vault and I've never touched and I probably never will. Editing is, editing is kind of a, a different type of a grind. I don't know if you've seen any of my recent videos, but I definitely have an editor and he's so epic. He's just, he's just uh, in school and I wasn't able to convince him to drop out of school. He has one more semester left. So he, uh, he took the decision to, he was actually, I'll tell this story cause it's kind of crazy, but he was supposed to work for Jay. I found you so really? through Jay, through Jay. Yeah. So he was supposed to work for Jay. He went up to Canada and he told the border agent that he was working for Jay for the summer. And they told him that, Hey bro, you can't come to Canada. Like you can't, you can't make money in Canada. You're a U.S. citizen. Like you're a scrub. You, you don't believe, <laughs> you know, like, so they, they denied him the border and he came back and Jay was like, Hey, this guy needs a job for the summer. And he came, he lived 20 minutes from me. That's so incredible. it was like, yeah. And uh, now he's going to work remote for me. He already made one video at school, but he's, he's battling doing school and sending all my edits and my edits are just, I'm not sending this guy like a 64 gigabyte SD card. I'm giving him four and a half terabytes from Africa with like just so much BS on it that he's got to go through and make into a good video. So yeah, the editing, 
it does suck, but it's also fun sometimes. Like if you, I've, I've noticed with myself, if I really had fun making the video that the editing goes by so much quicker, but there's other times where if I don't really enjoy the edit or making the video, then I like get into the edit. I can tell I wasn't that enthusiastic. And then all of a sudden it's just easier to hit like X out of the program and move on to the next thing. Totally. Yeah. I even, I've seen that with like doing client work to like when we do the Chronicles, like we love, I love making the Chronicles and all that stuff, but doing client work, it's like, Oh my gosh, it's just kind of dragging on and on. And that's why I, I like, I'm just trying to get to doing my own thing as much as I can now. Cause like you said, it's just it's so much easier when you're passionate about it and you really enjoyed making it or the trip or whatever it was. Um, but with that, you're kind of talking about what it's all going and stuff. So like, what's next? You got the money like from the buyout and like all the stuff you did. You kind of got a little bit of a break. You're starting to come back around. Like, what's next? What's Alec Pear going to be doing in the next few years? We're going to see you at the St. Paul Ice Show. That's exciting. I don't know if I'll be at the St. Paul Ice Show, but Frostbite will definitely be there. We just um, hired a new person that's going to be like uh, in charge of all the shows. So I I'm probably will be there. Honestly, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not going to be there. I just through. don't. You'll I don't swing. want to, I don't want the guy who we just hired to be like, Oh, Alex is going to be there. So I don't have to do as much work. Like I want this guy to take over doing the shows and all the planning for that. And anyways, so I think what's next for me. I, it, it's so crazy for me how I wake up every morning and like seven hours will go by with all of these different calls from just different things I'm working on. And it's like, where did my day go? What did I actually accomplish today? And what am I trying to accomplish? I've got three or four companies that I work on every day. And whether it's like small tax stuff or big picture branding and stuff like that, I'm always trying to put my input and in stuff like that. I really though, I'm trying to find something a little bit deeper rather than work to work on. I, and I, and I don't know what that is. Like uh, I want to say yes to more things. And that's why I'm on this podcast because I feel like the more I say yes, the more opportunities come my way and the more direction I have, but I've been trying to develop like what my personal phrases or what my personal like uh, motto would be. And it's like, understanding why I'm so addicted to the outdoors is something that I kind of want to like put out there and figure out. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, other than working on like my businesses and trying to, I, I, I'm always watching these weird YouTube videos where there's like people that are struggling and then like somebody goes up to them and helps them. I like, I want to do something along those lines, but I don't want to come off as like, I'm just doing it for the views or doing it. But I always felt like it'd be cool if I started a YouTube channel that would help these people. And then like people that were watching the videos, like that video that made a couple hundred bucks. And then that hundred bucks would go towards the next person. And like the videos, like just from people watching those videos could change so many people's lives just from like taking the AdSense reinvesting the adsense reinvesting the adsense into like yeah. people kind of like beast I, philanthropy had, yeah yeah something along those lines um but to a much smaller scale than he would do so that's an idea um, do you think you'll I'm always working. work do you think you'll always work within a creative space in in the outdoor realm or do you think if you came up with an idea tomorrow like like seat geek for airlines and you were like it's lucrative i can nail it i'll do it and you make a trillion dollars, you know what I mean? Like way too much. And, and it, and it did invest a lot of your time. Do you think you would then go on to continue to just live an outdoor life? Like, like maybe a weekend angler would, except you could do it a lot more obviously, but just get out of the creative space of it. Or do you think you'll always to some facet play around with, with filming, editing, doing something creative within the outdoors along with the other business ventures? Or do you think if you really came across one that was just so big, You'd be like, you know what? I'm just going to go hunting and fishing now and never bring a camera or a phone again. The only thing I feel like it would ever, st I, I feel like, especially I inspire to when I have some kids someday, hopefully I want to be able to show them when they're 18, like 
a little story I made of them like growing up. I, I want to always like be able to capture my family stuff. And I don't know if I'd ever post that online, but one of the reasons why I took a break was like the comments really got to me. Like I'd have 150 positive comments and then one negative comment and all of my energy would be sucked out of me because of that negative comment. And I feel like sometimes I don't want to film because I don't want to be judged on like, I don't know the filming that I'm doing or the fishing I'm doing, but I want to post it. So I think the only way I would ever stop is if like I got canceled on the internet. I don't know. So, but you were part of an, a moment in my life where I almost did get canceled on the internet. Um, I but saved your I, lives. Yeah. I, but yeah. You were the one who texted me about it. And I, I, I think it's normal to make mistakes and stuff like that. It's just like how you deal with it. And I think my mental state now is like, I would just keep uploading no matter the comments got really bad. I would just be like, I mean, I like fishing. I'm sorry. Like I, I yeah. could see a world where in 10 years from now, like 99% of people think fishing is like animal cruelty or something. Like, I don't know. I don't know where the world's going. You know, like it's crazy. That, people. That was a really question. Judge you. Yeah. That was the question I was going to ask you next, just because obviously you're even old enough you kind of understand what the industry was before even the internet played a big game in it. And it was a lot of just TV shows and then maybe on the competitive side, like tournament angling. And now it's like, you know, such a large internet social media space. And then there's still tournament angling, but that overlaps into that. And then TV shows with YouTube that all overlaps into that. Like it's, it's very melded now. Where do you think it's going? And do you think it's going to move more towards short form content or will long form content always play or will, yeah. Like, where do you think it's going? You, you've seen, you've seen it evolve a lot. Man, I don't, I, as far as the content goes, I think there will always be space for long form content. I think it's the best way to tell a story and it's hard to tell us, even though people argue you could tell a story in 10 seconds. I just don't think you can really tell a real good story in 10 seconds. I do worry about like what the long-term effects are of like YouTube shorts and TikTok because I could see it affecting my um, like uh, focus period. I don't know what that's called. Where yeah. you focus on something yeah. for like, I can see it affecting Alex. Yeah. Same here, yeah. Man. There we go. <laughs> I can Same see here, it affecting, dude. affecting my attention span negatively. And just, I don't, I don't know. I, I, there's a lot of weird things going on in the world and it's hard to tell where things will be in 10 years from now, but I, I hope that there's still a fishing community and a hunting community and a community that enjoys the outdoors because I do feel like if more people did it, um, they would f feel fulfilled in life because I do get a lot of fulfillment from chasing animals and becoming successful in the outdoors. So, yeah. Well, with that, like in the, I think one thing people don't necessarily give you guys enough credit for just you and the Guggen squad is how much growth to the sport of fishing you guys actually brought. Like 100%. people, people are like, Oh, you know, bass and FLW or whatever, have these high school programs and that's, you know, what's doing it. It's like, no, they, they watch these YouTube videos of these guys having a great time and having all this. And now they want to go do it. And it, you saw it explode with the way you guys exploded. Like you guys created a huge ripple effect in the fishing industry of growth. And I think it's oftentimes overlooked. And there's a lot of people that create a lot of negative stuff towards that though. Like, especially when it comes to spots, like showing a spot or something, people would just lose their minds because we went and fished this spot and they didn't want the locals to to know about it um i i do think though it's good for kids to get involved in the outdoors and the overall positivity like the overall positive impact from it is better better than the negative impact i just i really wish that the dnrs did i know i'm going off on a way of tangent from this but i really do wish it w wisconsin and minnesota and illinois it wasn't based was, minnesota does this a little bit better especially than wisconsin but I wish there wasn't like all the inland lakes fell under the same Creel limit. I wish that based on the lake's population or the health of the lake, like there would be cycles when lakes got bad. Maybe they would say it's catch and release for a year or two or, all right, we're not going to have 25 bluegills being kept. It's only going to be 10 for this lake. And certain lakes that maybe had an abundance of fish, like smaller fish, they would encourage people to keep them. I feel like 
the DNRs are not basing their quotas on specific lakes. It's all just like generalized. And that really does affect like certain lakes because like a hot bite will happen and that lake will just like get cleaned out almost. And yeah. it almost needs to be like, Hey, let's take a break from this lake for a year or two. And then it will come back so much stronger than it did. And I feel like that would help with what I'm doing because then when I do maybe blow up a spot or something, it would be able to come back in a year or two once they gave that spot a break. But I don't do, know. Do you ever I'm, do you ever see yourself like I don't know. I know it's a weird question to to like be posed with, but like do you ever see yourself wanting to like advocate for those things or be in like more of a spot where you're like Yeah, the poli- a political know. side of the I'm, outdoor world. Yeah, or, like or, or you know advocate for change in this certain direction. Like yeah, you just said like you want to advocate for change for more managing on a micro scale within regions or lakes opposed to just like one macro view of just like boom. Everything everything six walls every lake except for last <laughs> <laughs> or red. Great. Yeah. I think that's a great, great question. And obviously like if my voice were to help, it would be good. But sometimes I look back on decisions I made and how I think about things and then how quickly I change my mind. I just got to make sure that when I do post the stuff and when I like go and attack a department of natural resources, like Minnesota for not allowing the, the automatic fisherman I think is the most ridiculous thing on earth. I just still to this day cannot wrap my head around that. And I want to go make a video in Minnesota using it and see what kind of ticket I get. But I, I just need to make sure that I'm like ready to do that. And I've got to like go at it with full force. And I don't think right now I'm like mature enough or I have enough knowledge or I've done enough like digging to actually say any of the stuff I'm saying. I think it was just, I, I look at my lake that I live on Dutch hall or, that I have a house on in Wisconsin, Dutch hollow Lake. And it used to be so good for big crappies and big bluegills and even bass. And it's just all these fish are just little. Now it got fished out. And I, and I would, if that lake had a catch and release for two years, I couldn't imagine how good the fishing would be after two years. And I've just, I think that's where this, this whole tangent is stemming from, but I could see myself maybe getting involved in the politics to, to answer your question to the short end of it. I don't know to what extent and I don't know how serious it will get, but I could see myself being involved in it. Yeah. I mean, I just think there's like a lot of not just content creators, but people in the outdoor industry right now, kind of in our age group or whatever that are kind of at some point going to have to be like the voice for these sports. Right. Cause like you got kind of like this weird political stuff going on now the world is like seemingly in shambles <laughs> with some of the decisions being made. Um, and it, it, you know, you, you see some outdoor groups kind of like looking towards some of these things, but um, they just don't have the traction that like out, you know, outdoor content creators have for actually making change or like having a voice for some of this stuff. So I don't know. I think it'd be interesting to see like how something like that could, drive you know decision makers to to do things like that change regulations or change kind of the the structure of some of like not just wildlife management but you know things for for regulations fisheries you know regulation stuff like that oh that's like we even when we filmed in maine it was even like us just trying to be like hey a crappie's a species well right a perch like, is a species don't just kill them all and leave them on the ice right yeah, definitely. Well, Sobe, Ryan, do you guys got anything else for Alex? Oh man, let me look. What? What? How typically long are these? I can't believe we just did this for almost two out two hours and twenty minutes. Is that normal? Like, <laughs> whatever feels right. You know? yeah, whatever feels whatever right. Feels yeah. Right. What? Do you got stuff for us, Peric? Been a hot um, minute. <laughs> yes. Ryan, what are you like? Full on content with like getting involved in the cooking and, and stuff like that? Or how, or what, what are you I'm doing not, for a job right now? I'm not. I should be. Um, no, I mean, I, I work just a regular nine to five and I've been doing stuff with Bart doing, you know, the Crappie Chronicles. And I've been working on a little bit of my own stuff here and there, but not consistent enough to, to rub two pennies together on it. But I, uh, yeah, I'm just working in, working a municipal, like natural resources job, trying to wrap my head around trying to make more content and figure out my way there. But yeah, the cooking stuff's been taken off and it's been super fun and a lot of good like feedback on it. So um, I don't know. It's just one of those things trying to get something off the ground is always intimidating until you actually, you know, do it. So 
that's kind of the spot I'm in now, but no, the crappie chronicles has been fun and kind of been my outlet for like a lot of the cooking stuff and just trying to get my legs under me as far as, you know, shooting like an outdoor slash cooking type content. So, but no, it's been fun. I I think I, I just wanted to say this. I watch like, I would say 50% of the YouTube shorts I watch are cooking shorts. Like, and man, it is so cool how like they, they start with something and then like all those like small chop shots and the sounding and in, in cooking and in kitchens. It's like, it's so aesthetically pleasing to watch cooking videos and I just freaking love watching them. And I think yeah. if I were, if I were to suggest anything, I think getting on YouTube shorts and making like little recipes on there, I think you get a couple videos that take off and the snowball effect on there will be in crazy. Like that's the way to grow. Uh, Sydney posted a video of her dad at a trade show and it got 40 million views um, a and she gained two, a YouTube short and she gained 200,000 followers off one YouTube short on YouTube. That's mind blowing. That's nuts. Wow. I was just talking. I think I was just talking to Sylvie about, it. I was like, I don't Cause like you make the reels and stuff. I'm like, I don't know. Should I post like our Chronicle shorts to YouTube shorts? I'm like, I don't want to bug people when like we do all this long form content, you know, but it's like, you have that possibility of it just going nuts. So hmm. there's, there's the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it. I think. Yeah. So like, sometimes I feel like the barstool channel, the barstool shorts, especially some of the ones with me, I'm like, who the hell was the one who decided to post this? Like who was like, let's take this and make it a short. I'm always constantly seeing that. But then some of the stuff that just goes viral, I'm like, well, kind of makes sense, I guess. So YouTube shorts, guys, if you want to grow, I guess that's the way to do it. Dang. There is something always there though, where where I feel like when you post a YouTube short and it would like, I've never posted one, but like you see on different channels, like they'll post a bunch of YouTube shorts and like, they'll kind of flop and then they'll post their main long form video and it does good. Like, I don't know. I would always feel weird about like doing that. I don't know why I I would feel weird. Like, I don't know why it matters. It doesn't matter. But like, I don't know why I would feel like, Oh, if I post eight YouTube shorts and they literally got nothing and then you could post a long form one and it does usual. I would just feel like, I don't know. That was bad. I shouldn't have done that. I don't know. Well, you just get so scared of ruining your channel. Like you were talking about Alex. Yeah, well, if there's anybody who's ruined their channel, it's definitely me by taking a, a nine-month break. It's crazy, though, that there's still people that want to watch me, so I guess I didn't ruin it, but uh, it, it is weird coming back to something like this, but I think it's going to be good. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep trying and, and reinventing some stuff. So, Obi, uh, you got some land for me to kill a deer on in Minnesota this Sunday or what? Or Saturday? Oh, my gosh. It's bow opener this weekend. That's so crazy. I for- always forget it's this weekend. Come kill come kill <laughs> stands are hung come kill i um i'm thinking about coming there honestly really? i'm yeah i'm chris and i are going to fish a tournament on lake of the woods the weekend after so we're gonna leave sunday so um yeah i'm gonna be in minneapolis next weekend so i'll let you know what i'm doing bring your bow maybe we'll fish or if you want to sit in a stand dude go i'm i am not prepared to bow hunt yet so you're more than welcome to go out and any of the stands I have set up, I'm not ready, dude. I'm not ready. <laughs> I have not been shooting enough. I'm not ready, dude. I'm ill prepared. I'm not. Start, I, I, start shooting. Be ready to hunt, but I'm not. I don't feel. Prepared. You could take a 20 I'm yard poke. I could. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on. I had some. I had some crazy shit happen in Wyoming with me. I, I've been shooting way too far. Like I shouldn't be shooting like 50 and 80 yard shots, but I've been taking them. And I had my long lens set up, and man, I've been using these four blade uh, G5s. And frick, those fixed blades at like 50 yards, once you get past 50 yards, it's like the arrow flight on them. Once you watch it in 120, it's like this. Like, oh, my gosh. Planes around really bad? Plane and like crazy. And I took these broadheads off and put other broadheads on, and I was just like shooting like a bullet. It's, I, I figured the issue out, but the only way to you figure the issue out is. Now? No, I still got some fixed ones I like. I just. <laughs> I love being able to blast through that front shoulder, man. I just love that. I hear you. I, I kind of switch between them too. Cause it's like, there's certain situations where you kind of want the fix for sure. But God, those mechanicals fly so good far. <laughs> it's hard to, yeah. But I think I I've had two animals, my Wisconsin whitetail last year and my antelope this year that I just shot. I, the antelope wasn't a gut shot, but the whitetail was definitely a gut shot. And with the fixed blade, like, 
the animal went 150 yards and died within an hour, even with a gut shot with the fixed blade. So I just yeah. love that whole, I feel so confident when I hit them. And, and obviously my shooting has gotten way better since last year, but uh, yeah, totally different topic. So what what was the deal? Just since we're talking about it already, you said you had, was it this year? You said you had your longest bow kill or what was that? Yeah. Africa, 78 yards or whatever. Holy yeah. Balls. Yeah. 78 yards. What, what animal was that on? It was on an eland. Okay. Um, I don't know. Can I send chat fi- pictures in this chat? Uh, I think you'd be able to. I give or, it a shot. What, what can look it up like on the eland. Yeah. So what seventy-eight lo- yard shot, huh? Seventy-eight yard shot, beautiful. Um, blasted through the front shoulder. The arrow when we were skinning it, that it broke in half, and the arrow actually went up into its throat, half the arrow. So that. And, uh, it went maybe 50 yards and it was standing there. It was standing there. We had a dog with us and we caught up to it right away. We did give it any time to lay down, which is kind of, I don't know, maybe want to give it a little bit of time, but we came up to it and it was just standing there gushing blood out of the side of them. And, it was gruesome. It was definitely the most gruesome thing I've ever witnessed in my life. And luckily it just fell down and died. And yeah, I, it made me really appreciate life though. I, when you, when you become a hunter, your whole mind changes about food. And when you're going to Chipotle and getting your chicken burrito, you just feel a little bit different about everything. You're you you become more conscious of everything as soon as you start hunting, I think. And uh, yeah, I don't know. So are are you are you like are you eating a lot of game meat now? I mean, you're doing a lot of hunting, and it seems like you're, you know, having some success. So, I've got a fridge f- or a freezer full of antelope right now. Um, the, all the meats in Africa, unfortunately, we couldn't take any of them home. But we ate every night and every day for like lunch and breakfast. Like we were eating all the animals we could. We went to a local village and donated about five hundred pounds of meat. Um, to there and it's pretty cool in argentina for instance like we got to eat the back straps but there's a huge red stag like what do you do with all the meat they actually turn it into sausages and sell it to the local markets so like these places are ready and are set up to use the entire animal um got a bunch of hide rugs made got all the mounts made and nothing gets wasted on the animals which is super cool and i i love the aspect of an animal living in the wild its whole life and then it dying in the wild. It's never in a cage. It's not being farm raised. And I think that that's a way better life than a chicken that never sees the light of day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to give me, I could talk about this for hours. So I, I, dude, <laughs> Al, Al, I gotta don't tell even you. get me started on this. <laughs> if, if, if you never fish again with barter, I, that is totally fine, but you need to do a trip or more trips with Ryan. You guys, he's, He's such a sweet self-taught cook and you freaking, you love your Traeger on the back of your boat. And I know you're getting more into cooking and obviously you're huge into hunting now. Like his whole, Ryan is like this amazing self-taught cook and he monkeys with meat like no other man I've ever met. You guys got to go on trips together, dude. And everything he does is like freaking it's, it's do it yourself. It's DIY. And And it's just like, Ryan's style and your style would meld so good together. Like you got to do, you guys got to go on a hunting trip together. You too. And then when you're on the hunting trip, you got to convince Ryan to quit his job. I've only, I, you've said it to other people, Jason, I've worked on it hard. I've only ever said this to one person. I think Ryan should quit his job and try this full time. He's the best DIY outdoorsman I've ever met. And, and it probably doesn't mean much coming for me or Bart, but maybe it mean more coming from you. So when you guys are doing a trip sometime, you just need to be like, dude, quit all that shit and just do it. Well, this wasn't supposed to turn Screw. into a pump my tires mission. Hey, I'm here. not trying to pump your tires. I'm not trying to pump your tires. But, like, I want you just to go on a trip with Al, and then you come home and you go, City Chan Hassan, dude, I'm out of here. I'm done. <laughs> Goodbye. I'll tell you later. I'm never coming back into work. I know, I know for a fact, and I'm definitely going to see Bart again and fish with Bart because I don't know what it is about your face, Bart, but anytime I see you on social media, I like, I'm just so happy. You ma- oh, you God. literally make me happy, Adam. So I need to go fishing with you. So be, that's so maybe nice. we'll fish, maybe we're we'll fish together soon, <laughs> but, but Ryan, that sounds fun. I, this year I'm really bummed. I did a lot of, not a ton of research, but 
I want to do some elk hunting and with my, maybe there's, maybe there's still time. There's over the counter stuff in October. And I have like, I have the first week of October kind of open right now um, before kind of the rut happens. And I know right now is a good time to go after the elk, but uh, if you find something that you want to go, I got a truck, I'll fill her up with some gas and pick you up and we can go out West and try and kill an elk. I think that's something I'd be interested in. Yeah. Elk hunting sweet. I've, I've been doing that quite a bit. I have a really good tag at the end, end of, well, end of October into November for that. But there, yeah, Is there's it, tons do you have, a, of, do you have a, a rifle tag or what do you have? Yeah. Yeah. I have like a limited entry rifle tag for Colorado. Nice. Yeah. Do you have somebody filming you on that or are you going solo or what's your plan? Uh, it's right now it's me and my, me and my dad both drew it. So I'm kind of a self film mission right now, but it should be, yeah. I mean, I don't know. There's, there's a, there, there's a lot of opportunities out West. So, I mean, yeah, for sure. I yeah, looked I'm up getting... Dink and I was like, I'll come film it for you. And he's like, Bart, I'm be honest for your first Western hunt, you would die. So no, <laughs> where, where I'm going, dude, there's no way Bart I'm you right now, dude. I haven't volunteered to do it. I was like, this will be fun. He's like, no, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the shit. That's the shit I like. Honestly, I like going out and barely making it back home. I think that's awesome. Yeah. And I'm, Right, I'm also getting into this now, like all this point stuff, man, where you got to apply oh. for all these points and all this Isn't stuff. So it's just like, it's honestly, confusing. I've tried to explain tag systems. In, like there's some states that aren't too bad, like states like Colorado, but then there's other places like, I'll say like Montana and, you know, that I just explain, like, I know how the tag system works and explaining it to someone is like, I'm like, I'm doing stand up comedy. You know, <laughs> they're, they're like, yeah, what well, bullshit, that's how it works. And I'm like, yeah, no, for real. <laughs> no yeah there's there's some terrible terrible tag systems out there but yeah luckily there's a lot of over-the-counter options so yeah true for sure well cool yeah i appreciate you guys inviting me on this podcast it's always fun to chat with old friends and yeah i uh hopefully get to see you guys soon if you guys ever want me on again let me know i'm i'm a free agent willing to do whatever it takes to make it in this cruel world we call earth yeah well perfect yeah, no dude. i think Thank you for coming, Peric. Like we said, kind of bringing it back full circle. Like I'm very thankful for like that day in September, October, whatever, when we met at Dick's and like, there's a bunch of people in Minnesota that trickle effect, like life change because of us all meeting. And it's definitely, I mean, we've all carved our own paths and everything, but it started there with then going out fishing after and like that long way like i would not be doing this here right now if it weren't for that and also you you know took Sobe, and then i had to learn to film and edit and all of a sudden i'm like i like this and yeah so thank you for everything i mean you did yeah, a lot thank for you, all dude. of us seriously too, without thank even you the boys and i can't be more thankful it's and and even before we had met you you and a lot of other guys really paved the way for outdoor content the way it's consumed now and the way people see it and it's yeah you you really you, you moved trends and set trends and it was a, a true, it's an overused word, but you guys were game changers in, in multimedia and you still are today. And it's not even done. You know what I mean? Your career is just getting started. It really is. You, what are you, you're not even 20, what are you 25, 26? Bro, you're not 26. even 30 yet. I just turned 30. 20, Everything hurts. A, Hurry up. Saying. Like <laughs> I'm, thank you. Thank you for coming on the podcast too. Yeah, no problem guys. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah. I'll talk to you later. Peace out. Happy days. Uh, cheers to full a life full of outdoor content. Perfect. Love Thank it. you, AP. Appreciate it, man. Thank, Thank you. you to everybody Thank for you. listening.